One of the reasons why Mary is a perpetual virgin is also because she is. Listen, if the Orthodox aren't Christians, like no one's a Christian. You're right that we can learn from Protestants to make reading scripture part of. Those people end up becoming weirdos in every measurable word in the mm. Protestant art. Like they're just, they're just freaking weird. I don't want to be around them, they're jerks, or they believe some crazy stuff. So your guys' take on Luther was fascinating to me. What should have Luther yeah. really done? Bruce Lawn. We have. Jonathan Pejo in the house. Thank you so much for being here. It's great. It's part two of our, our conversation. Great. And we have Neil from Dirt Poor Robbins. Okay. So um guys, these are my uh these are my Orthodox friends. All right, we'll see if they can close me on the <laughs> Orthodox Church by the end of this stream. Uh, but we were just having a fantastic conversation. Jonathan, a lot of people don't know that you are. Like a huge hip hop head. <laughs> That's hilarious. Huge. I'm not a huge. I would say I'm a huge hip hop head. I am someone that in my life I I really have enjoyed music, and uh, I actually was a kind of more of a punk rocker when I was a teenager. But I listened to Public Enemy, mm -hmm. you know, and to kind of the the, the hip hop that was the Beastie Boys mm -hmm. and all of that rap mm -hmm. that was close to to punk music. Uh, and then you know I remember like some later listening to to. To some of the fusion stuff, like the Far Side and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff that was going on. A little bit of Trap Call Quest. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Same. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I kind of dropped off for a while, and it was really is like 2004, mm -hmm. 2003, 2004. You dropped off during the gangster rap era. Yeah, I w it's just like because I was. I mean, you know, I was. It was just too much for me. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really. I, I was like, what is going on with mm -hmm. this? And I, I didn't particularly <laughs> uh, like what was happening. I remember when Tupac got killed, like mm -hmm. you know, and and I was like, what is this? Like I, mm -hmm. I, I felt like it was it was a little. It was a little crazy for mm -hmm. me um, and a little too real life, let's say. Mm -hmm. But then in around 2004, I have a friend of mine, I was living in Congo at the time, mm -hmm. like living in Africa. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine was really into hip hop and he just mm -hmm. kept trying to like get me to listen to hip hop. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, fine. He like that back in the day, we'd make like mixed CDs, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, yeah. burn them on the CD, burn them. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, and then there was Jesus Walks on that CD, mm -hmm. and I really love that song. Like, mm -hmm. there's something about it, and so I just yeah, I started listening to hip hop again. You know, like despite the lyrics, you know, mm -hmm. kind of loving Dr. Dre and the beats, mm -hmm. and just kind of understanding what was going on and mm -hmm. Jay Z, and then also seeing like the the level of lyrical capacity that was being developed, mm -hmm. and being really impressed by mm -hmm. that as well. Like remembering, you know, you know, if you listen to like back before that, you know, like the Beastie Boys and stuff, like they were mm -hmm. great. Like the beats was great, the music was great, but mm -hmm. it's like the 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 lyrical capacity was pretty limited. Like it's not like there was this multiple the multiple syllable yeah, rhyming. Multiple it's like, syllable, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So hearing that, I re I was really impressed, and I, so I kind of also appreciated the yeah. artistry of it. Yeah. So Kanye kind of brought you back to hip hop. It sounds like I would think so. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. And we're gonna try to bring Kanye back to the light. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, guys, if you're just tuning in live, let me know where you're watching this from. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys. Drop your location in the chat. Uh, let me know if you guys got any specific questions for Jonathan or Neil. Neil, you are a phenomenal musician in your own right. So I think it's only right that as we're talking about music and art and all of all of the things. Can you pull the mic just a little bit? Like, just, yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Um, talk to the mic. Make sure they can hear you. Yo. Can you guys hear, hear Neil? Okay, cool. I think they could hear you. Your signal looks like it's coming through. Ah. Uh. Um, I can't fully hear you on my headphones because we're kind of doing this little hodgepodge of a setup. But we got Kansas City, uh, New Hampshire, Ontario, Canada. Canada. There you go. There we go. Um, so a little bit about your background in terms of your your artistry. My hip-hop career. Your hip-hop. Yeah. I'm going to hear all the bars you've dropped. No, I was a hip-hop fan for a short period of time. Uh, I was a b-boy when breakdancing first really? was a thing. Yeah, it was my first You're professional kind of job. to be a b-boy. <laughs> well, I wasn't big then. I was like 11. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was, I was good, really though, I love breakdancing. So, so I I Grandmaster that, so. Flash, Run yeah. DMC, those yeah, were my bands Run back DMC. then. Even Herbie Hancock, when he, yeah, when he slipped right. into some of the instrumental kind of hip-hop, that was my scene. But then, yeah, I got in, I bought a guitar, mm -hmm. and it all changed. <laughs> and so my, my dancing career ended. I, I danced and I got paid to dance in a commercial and a couple of parties. And I was so really? young that I actually was like buying like toys with money I was making. I remember like trying to be all cool, uh, sitting around with people with like your headband and your studded bracelet and your parachute pants. And I was always like, we were sitting around talking, trying to pretend to be cool. Hmm. We're like, what are you going to buy with your money? It's like, I'm getting Optimus <laughs> Prime, man. Yeah. I'm getting a Transformer. But when we were teenagers, we had the problem of having like, MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice and oh, all of that, that yeah. weird flashy mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. which was just not good. Like the lyrics were horrible, mm -hmm. and everything about it was just 
was just unbearable to watch. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we had to deal with that. And so yeah, that, no, that was we, probably we one of the things that soured me on on the whole scene. Too. I earned like, these gray hairs. Um, <laughs> so, earned these gray hairs. Give me one second. Let me fix something on this camera before we keep going because I got all of us on screen at the same time. I just want to readjust this orientation. Do you so want me to just gonna, keep talking while uh, you're doing that? Uh, sure. You sure. So you asked me about my musical yeah, background. That's right. That's true. So, um, yeah. So really... Um, my whole family was in entertainment and music. It was something native to us. Our Christmas parties were crazy. Uh, it was like being with the Von Trapps from The Sound of Music. There were, everybody had four-part harmony, and it was loud. It was very overwhelming to bring a girlfriend in for Christmas because she's like, I can never do this. <laughs> I think it's wonderful, but I am you know, I also feel less than this. So um, it was something native to us. So it was weird because I didn't know. Uh, I was actually the only guitar player in my family. Mm -hmm. So it actually turned out to be a wonderful advantage to me because I didn't know other guitar players. So the only people I had to compare myself to when I started at like 12 was like Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> and, and so I didn't know that what he was doing was hard. So I just learned it and played it. Like it was Respect. like I was it was like <laughs> Inspector Gadget or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that or like you know when the cartoon characters walk out over the cliff. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, because yeah. they haven't recognized they're off a cliff, they don't fall. I felt like that's when my music career started. So that's amazing. Okay, um, listen. Let's just let's just let's just get to it. Oh, okay. Do you, you need a sound for that? Ooh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we won't do a sound for that. All uh, right. Why should I be an Orthodox Christian? Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. I love that question. Just, just, just cut to the chase. Well, we got a lot of Orthodox folks that watch this right. channel. They're super excited. Like I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah. Orthodox Christianity. There's Aaron Humphrey. Okay, so. Um, all right, here, okay. Here's your chance to close. So, me. so I'm not like I'm not I'm not that kind of a guy. But <laughs> I know, I know this. Well, like, this is like the worst you thing. You can't answer that question. Like, it's not for him. This is it. No, so I would say like yeah. I, I would can all, all yeah. I can tell you is the way that I came to discover in Orthodoxy mm -hmm. the fullness of the faith. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the best way to understand mm -hmm. it. And like even now today, I don't. I don't think that people who that aren't Orthodox aren't Christian or that mm -hmm. they're all going to hell or all that. We're kind still of stuff. in. I'm still in. I think I think that okay. I think I see it as a hierarchy, like okay. a, a kind of hierarchy of participation. That, like I see most things. It's a great so, okay. You know. So Orthodox are at the high at the peak of the hierarchy. <laughs> then, Someone's then, be on top, then, man. then you got Protestants, Catholics. Who's that? Well, just tell me I'm, oh, I'm no, on top. This I'm, is a bad this game. This is horrible. <laughs> this is a so, bad game. <laughs> definitely. So I, I'm fine. But like, just for fun, we can do it. Like I do. I think that I think that the the, the Eastern Orthodox. I think they have like a kind of fullness. Uh, and then after that, you have. I think Coptic Oriental Orthodox, which are not not the same, and then sure. he's doing it. That's how I, I grew up. That, <laughs> yeah, by the and so way. I think and that, I still go. I think that there is like you know when I go to when I encounter uh, Coptic mm -hmm. uh, Christians or mm -hmm. or or even uh, kind of what we call Syrian Church, mm -hmm. you know that, mm -hmm. that these mm -hmm. these kinds of churches. Yep. Like I I feel like it's the same flavor. Like it's the same aroma. Like it's mm -hmm. this. You feel like it's there's very literally close, an aroma right? really in the service. Cool, also, yeah. Uh, Frankincense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I would say for sure Catholicism, although man, like, <laughs> come on, you got, keep, you got, you got, you, you got to give us trouble. a little. You got to give us just a little getting bit. In trouble, in trouble, in trouble, in trouble. Uh, you know, and then so let me, let me, I would, let me, let me set it up for you. Like what I think though okay. is that there is a reality to hierarchy in the sense that the 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 hierarchy, the way hierarchy works is that like the more you move towards purpose, mm -hmm. the more you move towards something that's kind of pointed and and very. Um, that that has maybe a bit of less body, mm -hmm. right? In the sense that it it's not as it doesn't reach as far, mm -hmm. right? Because you're kind of moving towards the purpose. Sure. But as you move away from the peak of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. you kind of have this this m more more reach, you could say. Mm -hmm. And I think that the one thing you know to kind of give credibility to, to Protestantism that it has is that it has reach, mm -hmm. because in some ways. You know, even despite itself, the mm -hmm. fact that it's fragmenting and splintering and mm -hmm. breaking and fighting amongst each other, the weird thing about it is that through that, to me, I think it's a scandal. But through that scandal, mm -hmm. I think ultimately Christ is using that to manifest himself in places that we would never be. And so although I do think that the the breakdown of the church that happened in the in all the Protestant schisms mm -hmm. is something which is not, which is not good, mm -hmm. I think that God often transforms that into a good by basically like, you, know, you have like you have all these denominations and they're all kind of everywhere in the mm -hmm. world and every mm -hmm. little tribe every little mm -hmm. group is in contact with Christianity and mm -hmm. I think that that definitely is a is a good thing mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I mean, we never talked about this because like that's exactly my thoughts on really? it there's Interesting. A, it's yeah I, I, and as much as 
Orthodox people aren't as dualistic about things. Like a certain category isn't necessarily automatically bad or automatically good. Sure. So there's the positive scandal. I mean, like what happens to Christ, you know, the a God who's crucified mm -hmm. is a scandal. Like he inhabits the scandal with a, like a new capital S and makes it a holy thing. Mm. Um, so there's something about the way Christianity spreads out in the world. Even even Paul talks about this, like where there's like, hey, these it's being reported to him that someone else is spreading the gospel mm -hmm. uh, for selfish gain. Mm -hmm. He's like, and, you know, and your point is like, yeah, they're not the church, mm -hmm. but he's like, that's going to, if it's the gospel, it's mm -hmm. going to do good in the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's a way to look at it that way. But um, for people who aren't familiar, because, you know, you, you talk about, I was not that familiar with orthodoxy just as, as little as six years ago, mm -hmm. right? And I went on this quest to figure out what the early church was. And so I started with, because I knew the Bible didn't exist the Bible we have didn't exist right away. I was like, well, who made the Bible and what were they doing? Because mm -hmm. this is clearly, this is, you know, what's the most important book to all mm -hmm. Christian denominations? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, it was the Orthodox that made, the, put the Bible together. They were part of that canonization process. So uh, there was one of the things I learned as I was becoming Orthodox when, because right away, as soon as you're something different to someone else, they give you a pushback. And it's like, listen, if the Orthodox aren't Christians, like no one's a Christian. Like this is the tradition that brought you the Bible that we, that we all love. Like, you're very happy with the book. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, you, it's more complicated right. than what I just said. But, you know, you got to be at least be like, hey, thanks, Orthodox. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to qualify that in the sense that— I know, that, I know. Like, to qualify it in the sense that— So, the reality of, of most Christians, even mm -hmm. the most kind of Protestant evangelical Christians, is that what they believe mm -hmm. is what was defined and uh, agreed upon— in the Council of Nicaea, yes. yeah. right? So I would say yeah. that most Christians, even if, even if they don't know it, mm -hmm. a lot of evangelical Protestant Christians, they would they would agree with the creed that was developed there, mm -hmm. right? And they they would they can probably understand it, although the the Bible was informed at the creed mm -hmm. that the creed part, the, I mean at Nicaea mm -hmm. that Nicaea is in some ways part of the crystallization method where it's like after Nicaea, mm -hmm. we pretty much all agree what the Bible is, sure. you know, like even though yeah. before I would say it would still, it was, pretty, it was, it was, it was kind of there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I would say that it, at Nicaea, we have this kind of like, okay, we all, we're all kind of agreeing on this. Mm -hmm. Now there's this weird narrative, like in, in the, in the church, like this weird thing where on the one hand, people criticize the Catholic and the Orthodox position mm -hmm. for like being, you know, going with the emperor, Constantine is the beginning of the fall. Like all this is, is mm -hmm. now the beginning of the end, you know, and then, and then, and then because of that, then they start having like monks and all this weird mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. and like liturgy and all this stuff. And it's like, the problem is that all of these things are together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, Constantine is the one that called the council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. And the people at the Council of Nicaea, like St. Athanasius, who who gave us on the Incarnation and was the one calling out at the Council for people to go with the idea that Christ was of the same nature as the Father, mm -hmm. uh, that Logos was the same nature as the Father, mm -hmm. you know, he wrote the first hagiography. Mm -hmm. He wrote he wrote the first life of St. Anthony, mm -hmm. who was the first monk that we, that we have a story for. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, if you just say, if you go in there and you're like, well, you know, I, you know, this is the church, but mm -hmm. then you know, a thousand years later, you're like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, but not this and not that. And mm -hmm. Athanasius is super important because he basically helped us believe what we believe. But, you know, I'm going to cut this part out and this part out and this part out. And it's like, well, what is your criteria at yeah, some yeah. point? Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. that once you discover that all of these things kind of, kind of happen all at the same time, then you can at least have the generosity to look at it with with that with that spirit of generosity yeah, and say yeah. maybe I could understand why this is happening. Yeah, maybe yeah. I can understand why these things are setting themselves up. Yeah. And 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 the same thing happened with liturgy. Yep. Right. So it's like when as soon as the Christians had the capacity to create public buildings uh -huh. without being persecuted by the Romans, they, they, they the immediately yep. went into yep. creating this the a, a space that is the liturgical equivalent of what we have mm -hmm. still today mm -hmm. in the traditional church, mm -hmm. which is based on the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of like a, a holy place, but in the holy place is not the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. it's the altar. Because mm. in Revelation, the lamb is on the altar and, mm. and the angels turn around. Yeah. People always think that like uh, traditional Christian worship is based on the Old Testament. It's mm -hmm. not. Mm. It's based on the, book the of final Revelation. vision of uh -huh. all God revealing everything. And so... That happens right away. And mm -hmm. the first decoration of the churches was apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. The 24 elders, mm -hmm. like the early churches, earliest churches we have was, was this kind of idea that we are entering into the kingdom. 
that the kingdom of God is already accessible now. Yeah. That what is described in Revelation, the prayer of the angel, like this cosmic prayer that you see with like the angels praying around the, the altar with the lamb and mm -hmm. the incense and and like singing. And, and it's like, that's what that's what we should be aiming for. Yeah. So like yeah. if we use the incense in the church, it's because of the book of Revelation. Yeah. It's all based on this like, this revelation of, of the final image of, of worshiping God. Yeah, yeah. It, so. I think to give people a little bit of context, there's been four major schisms in the church, right? We had the in, the schism between the Oriental Orthodox uh, breaking away from the church uh, over language issues. We don't have to get into that, but that's I come from the Oriental Orthodox of the church. That's how I was brought up, Armenian Apostolic. That's the Coptic Church. That's the or Armenians. That's the uh, Ethiopians. Ethiopian. And am I forgetting? Assyrians? The, there's some Syrian churches some, some that Syrian are, churches, yeah. yeah. The Syrian churches are complicated. There's a lot of them. Yeah. So, so there's there's that. Then there's the big schism. Well, there's the Nestorian schism, which because you still have the Nestorians are now they're in communion with Rome though now, which is interesting. The Nestorians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Nestorianism the, is on the rise. When did that? When did that schism happen? That this is where I, I my understanding is it, it's after Chalcedon. Okay. And so it's like the next thing, mm -hmm. which was discussing the. It, it's always the problem about defining because this is the problem with jesus right mm -hmm. it's like we ca and 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 uh, you know i don't want to like i don't want to i want to be careful not to justify and say that everybody in this schism is right you know i, I do have a position mm -hmm. but there there's this weird mystery where it's like god presents himself to us mm -hmm. in as a man so how do we deal with that because mm -hmm. if we emphasize too much one side emphasize too much the other if we emphasize too much the union mm -hmm. then every time we do too much of one mm -hmm. we we run the risk of breaking the link that mm -hmm. connects heaven and earth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so right. a lot of the schisms are, are are that, but those are the two first, the like first big two. schisms. And then there's the the the, the big split of 1050, yeah. right? Which is when the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic split. Yeah. And why did why did that happen? So there are two reasons. One is that. During the councils, the the the, the Nicaea Constantinople book, um, creed mm -hmm. was kind of like the final creed that the whole church agreed upon, okay. right? And in that in that church in that in that a creed, it says that the the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Mm -hmm. But in the in the West, they were dealing with the problem of Arianism because mm -hmm. this is actually a schism before the other ones. Like mm -hmm. there, there were still Arian Christians for a very long time mm -hmm. in the barbarian lands, like mm -hmm. in the German mm -hmm. lands and in and up there. And so because of that, the, the problem of the divinity of Christ was mm -hmm. one they were really struggling with. Mm. And, and in part because of that, and for other reasons, they added this little sentence in the creed, which was that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? It's called the philoque. It's, we call it the filioque. Mm. Filioque. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because of, and, and in some part also because of Islam, mm -hmm. Islam coming in and like wrecking you know the christian uh the christian empire mm -hmm. breaking apart like basically you know cutting cutting the the two from each other like mm -hmm. the east and the west and making mm -hmm. it difficult to communicate mm -hmm. by the time they started coming back together mm -hmm. like just before get, getting ready for the crusades in some ways mm -hmm. you know uh i mean not yet but like trying to like consolidate and come back together mm -hmm. they realize that there was this massive difference mm -hmm. and it's like why do you have this in the creed they have, some people already knew and were mm -hmm kind of talking about like you can't have this in the creed mm. but when they started to kind of communicate again together mm -hmm. then it was like this it, is but doesn't the gospel of john kind of say both in 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 the opposing chapters yeah. and say like from the father yeah. and from the son so there so this is the this is the the this is i think the problem and the the problem is was solved in a, in a council which is called the council of florence mm -hmm. that nobody accepts and they don't accept <laughs> it in many ways for political reasons because mm. it was at a time when the catholic church was very militant and very strong was trying to kind of take over mm -hmm. uh, but the council of florence this the uh, declared that in some ways we're not talking about the same thing mm -hmm. which we could say that metaphysically like in terms of within the 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 the, the divine the divine relationships of the persons mm -hmm. that the holy spirit proceeds from the father mm -hmm. right as is described in genesis one mm -hmm. right it's like it's like the, the spirit of God hovers above the waters mm -hmm. and then the logos of God comes right. down, right? right? So it's right. like, this is a Trinitarian description in Genesis mm -hmm. 1. Um, and that, but that in relationship to creation, like now in the world, mm -hmm. that the spirit is is manifested through the sun, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
And so in some ways, it's as if there's like a confusion mm. in the creed about what is it we're talking about when we say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Mm -hmm. And the Council of Florence said ultimately that it, we're talking about how it proceeds in creation. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, if that was the case, mm -hmm. if we had really accepted that and, you know, that the Orthodox could probably go along with it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the fact that that's not what the creed was talking about at the outset, mm -hmm. at least not thought what the Orthodox understood the creed to be talking mm -hmm. about, then it became very difficult for them to finally, you know, go along with that, mm -hmm. that proposition. Mm -hmm. But you'll find the idea that in terms of creation, mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, you find that in Eastern Fathers as well. Like okay. it's not, it's not like it's not. So that, so that's the. But then, the, but the reason for the other reason for the schism uh -huh. is so, so. Hold on, just uh, the Catholics said from the Father, the uh, Orthodox Father said, and the Son. The the, the Catholic said the son, Father the and the Son. Yeah. And the Orthodox said from the Father. Just from the Father. Yeah. Okay. So that's the which that's was the, the original the formulation in. The, the 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 Nicaea Constantinople Creed, okay, which is the the creed that the whole church had agreed upon, okay, you know, okay, um, but one of the reasons why they were never able to reconcile about this, and and why the Council of Florence, for example, never succeeded, mm -hmm. was for the second reason of the schism, okay, which is the difference of understanding how the church works mm -hmm. and how authority works in the church, mm -hmm. which is that in the Catholic image mm -hmm. of authority, the Pope is like kind of like a legal authority mm -hmm. that has jurisdiction mm -hmm. over every single bishopric and every single church. And they were extending that authority to the Eastern Orthodox churches as well? That is how they viewed that that's how it works. So for them... Just the, the Bishop of Rome, because of Peter, we have dominion over the Eastern churches as that well. Is the way that, that is the way that the Catholic Church still functions today. Well, well, I, I know yeah. that's how they function yeah. today, but it right. a, there's a, there's a, there's a bigger grab of power, yeah. if you and will. And so, but the Eastern Church, the way they understood it, is that there was primacy of Rome. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the tradition. Mm -hmm. And you can see it all through the early centuries mm -hmm. when, when there's a theological problem or when there's an ecclesiolog ecclesiological problem, like mm -hmm. some conflict in the church, mm -hmm. they would appeal to the Pope of Rome mm -hmm. and ask the Pope of Rome to, to mediate mm -hmm. and to kind of give, a, give his statement to be able to solve a, a dispute between mm -hmm. bishops or between the, the or, or for some reason, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, and that is how the Orthodox understood it, mm -hmm. and not as a as a jurisdictional thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the and that is still how it works today. So they saw the Pope as as, as a first among equals, or or not. That was the way that they saw it. Yeah. The okay. First among equals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me let me cut in for a second here too, because um, I think sometimes like historical information uh, comes by, and it's kind of like, well, what are people arguing over? <clears throat> and I think that there's over time has been revealed like uh, with the adding of um, and proceeds from the sun that that it did create a different pattern of thinking in the West than it does from the East. I don't think you get to add that for free um, to the to the creed, meaning that what you saw develop in the West and you can make your own judgments about this in the East where things remained um, holistic, meaning in the sense that there was the sense of acts of service and and the right spirit, the right knowledge and where mystery was preserved more, it felt like in the West they started trying to dot and cross the T's on some things that we would consider an ineffable mystery. Mm -hmm. Meaning that when the Holy Spirit, yeah, like explaining the Eucharist, yes, basically explain like, the Eucharist in like tra like it's, like it's not a mystery terms, anymore yeah. how the Eucharist functions. There's some kind of scientific materialistic definition. Yeah, was, yeah. So the logos, Christ. Um, is where we've come, we pull up the word logic from. Mm -hmm. And so there became, I think that in the West suffers from, and we still suffer from this today, uh, an overemphasis on rationality and logic mm -hmm. um, because it doesn't account for the fact that people can't live on logic uh, and reason alone, that mm -hmm. we're not entirely, I mean, Jonathan makes a great point about this too in a uh, video I've, I've seen of his. Um, so I think that you do give up something there um, in a big way that it, I think it did skew the sense of what makes us whole and how those three relationships work together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, that, yeah, the scholasticism, some of the uh, things, I'm just throwing words out there, people <laughs> may not know what they mean. Uh, some of these things, I, I, I think there, there is a way that you can make a case and a connection to that actually that change and that change of emphasis uh, led to the some of the bad sides of the Enlightenment, you know, mm -hmm. as well, and some of the rationality that came about. Yeah, well, for sure, in terms of the authority problem, what, what it ended up doing was... You know, 
reality has a balance to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like if you you have to find the balance between between authority and freedom, or between authority levels at different at different levels of reality, right? So you can you know you know what that is. Like if you're a boss, mm -hmm. you have to be mm -hmm. careful. You have to leave enough autonomy of the people that are under you. They kind of have to have their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can't just try to control everything all the way down to uh -huh. the bottom. Uh -huh. And so yeah. one of the issues that that created in the West is this kind of papal kingship mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. basically the Pope now till today, mm -hmm. if he wanted to remove a priest from a parish here in San Diego, he mm -hmm. could. He could, He yeah. could just say, this priest, out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that is something in the orthodoxy, which is absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's just not, we don't, we don't understand authority that mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. right? It, like the, the president of the United States cannot tell the mayor of Chicago what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and although yeah. the mayor of Chicago will recognize the president as commander in chief is mm -hmm. you know the leader of the nation all of this and will 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 defer to him even mm -hmm. for some direction for the country sure. and might listen to him like in terms of how we're going to how we're going to move toward the country mm -hmm. like he doesn't have a jurisdictional capacity to act mm -hmm. so what that does is that it creates a kind of tyrannical system yep. but yep. tyrannical systems cannot hold like this is just a description of reality mm -hmm. like at some point they break mm -hmm. they shatter it's like yeah. you build a tower of babel mm -hmm. the tower of babel at some point is going to shatter because mm -hmm. you cannot hold everything together like mm -hmm. that in mm -hmm. a in a strict strict order and so the reformation in some ways is a normal conclusion of that tyrannical power shout right? out to the Protestant. <laughs> there we go. All right. I like where this is so, going. Well, you know, so it, it is, and, and to warm the category up to talk about something that's really more personal and even more understandable, I think, in the sense of grounding this idea, we all we all have this intuition about what how love functions between two people in the sense of, uh, you know, I you want to love someone. You don't want to force them to love you back. You don't want to demand. You don't want to have the efficiency and the power to force their actions out of them. You're Love is satisfying, it's deep, when it's voluntary. And we see that the God who makes the universe, we use this expression, playing God. And we only use the expression, playing God, when someone is doing something God would never do. Because he doesn't force himself upon us like this. God is looking for a voluntary amen from the church. Mm -hmm. And so you see this all throughout scripture where there's like some things that might seem enigmatic at first, like uh, where Dave, David takes this, King David takes a census and mm -hmm. is like, oh, it's a terrible thing. Where if... If you're trying Going to, to truly esoteric, yeah, Christian, I know biblical stuff. Right, here, I said yeah. I was going to warm it up too, and uh, make it more personal. <laughs> That's right. But well, think about it this way: if, <laughs> if you give authority, or authority decides it has too efficient of a path to control power, yeah, right, it's a problem because now love starts to break down mm. between the two, the the two the the uh, the sacrificing of themselves and their time and energy from the top as Christ displays, and then the the voluntary. Um, return yeah. uh, of an amen. So uh, I think that the the church historically was a more, up until a period of time, for a long period of time, was suspect of the world system mm -hmm. of the leader takes mm -hmm. command and forces response yeah, yeah. from people. So, so, so it sounds like you guys were early to the shenanigans that were happening in Rome. Is that <laughs> fair to say? You guys were like, ah, we see the writing on the wall. Yeah. Okay, the Pope is pulling for more power. They're not sticking to the traditions. They're making new traditions. And the logical conclusion of all of this was you guys leaving and then and then Luther and, and, the, yeah, and the Protestants. Yeah, but I would say schism. that I think we have to be careful because in some ways it's like, how can I say this? So if you, if you, if you try to control your kids too much, mm -hmm. right, and then, and then you try to control the control of the throne, and then finally they just break. Mm -hmm. And then they're like doing coke, and they're you know they're, they're getting drunk, and they're doing stuff. It's like you Kids could say sound pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you could say you could say, is it the parents' fault? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is the is the child, is it right for the child to do that? Mm. No, no. Right. So Protestants are the coke head. <laughs> <laughs> You're the coke head children of the no. Orthodox. What I mean, what shots I mean, fired, man. Do you have a sound effect for that? <laughs> All right. No, but what I mean, what I mean, it's important to understand. I'm not saying Protestants are coke heads. What I mean is that the <laughs> that the rebellion and the schism, the the, the schisms yeah. and the wars that bring, are brought about yeah. by. The, the the reformation and the mm -hmm. breakdown of the national churches mm -hmm. and all of that mm -hmm. like that is something which cannot be described as good in my mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. uh you know and that although i un it's like it's kind of like this it's, it's, i mean it's even even in revolutionary times like i always i i say like when i see the french people you know uh decapitating their king mm -hmm. it's like i understand why they did it mm -hmm. 
but they still shouldn't yeah. have. I w- th- right? It's like even though even <laughs> though French I understand Revolution why they did stuff it. is dark. I just went down yeah. that rabbit yeah. hole when I was. What in I mean is like I can yeah. have sympathy. I get underst- I understand it, but like yeah. that's still bad. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I can have sympathy for the 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 situation someone is in when they're in an impossible situation and that things things are too strong on them. Yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't justify. You know, it's like doesn't justify the reaction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, which leads us to so we talked about the first great schism. There was a smaller schism after that. Then it's the big schism of ten fifty. Mm. Uh, you guys bounce because you're like, yo, this is crazy. Okay. I wish we I could see, take credit we, for that. We see I, where the we see where the Pope uh, is going. Yeah, we see yeah. what you're about to do, right? Uh-huh. Papal infallibility. You guys saw it seven hundred years out. <laughs> That's right. right. And we're eight hundred years out. And then <laughs> you, uh, you guys, you keep getting credit. For <laughs> That's it. right. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, then, yeah. We're pretty smart. And we, were, Luther, we were smart back then. Luther pops on the scene. Luther is a uh, lay monk, so he's not a priest. Luther. Uh, more or less says everything you guys were saying, right? But just like it got worse, and calls that out. He's trying to reform the church, but it didn't. It didn't happen. He wasn't able to correct the church, and so Luther then starts Protestantism, which Protestants are uh, just. We just continued protesting upon protest upon protest upon protest, and that's how we have. I want to say uh, three thousand different Protestant denominations in America and forty thousand worldwide. Mm-hmm. Um, so your guys' take on Luther was fascinating to me. Mm. Okay, um, where you guys were like, "Yeah, like I get it. Like I understand yeah. why the, the the French were beheading everybody. Like I, I get it. I'm empathetic." Well, but like, sympathy for Martin Luther's which uh, which, which, sh- which should have yeah. what should have Luther yeah. really done. So I really, I mean, I thought about this a lot because in some ways, you know, when I became Orthodox, I came out of Protestantism. I really wanted to deal with this and think about it, and you know, I. Like I said, I have sympathy for Luther, and people are going to find it weird because it's like the strangest position where I stop having sympathy for him. <laughs> it's like I have sympathy for Luther up to the point where he names priests, uh-huh. which sounds weird to people, but it's like what it, what what the way to understand it is like when he, I have sympathy for his criticism of the church mm-hmm. to the point up to the point where he says, you know what, I'm the church, mm-hmm. right? When someone does that. Mm-hmm. And says, you know what? They're not the church. Yeah. I'm the church. Yeah. That is where it stops. Like you cannot do that. Mm-hmm. Authority has to come from above. Mm-hmm. Authority has to come from somewhere from where else. You cannot self-declare mm-hmm. your authority. Mm-hmm. And 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 this is something, this is just a principle of reality. Because mm-hmm. if you do that, then then you have the problem of Satan. Mm-hmm. Then you have the problem of pride. Mm-hmm. The problem of like deciding that 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 it's like I I am the one who can know what is good now. Mm-hmm. And then, so then he took the authority upon himself to name other priests. And ultimately that led to the idea that, that to, to the, to the fragment, fragmenting of all mm-hmm. the church, mm-hmm. what he should have done, which is horrible to say, because <laughs> I wouldn't have done it. And I'm not, I'm not taking credit for this, but what he should have done is he should have died. That should have been a martyr. Done. He should, if he had been a martyr, That's gangster. I think Martin Luther <laughs> would be a saint. I think that that's a, that's a, that's a that's a crazy take. That's yeah. a good take. That's an interesting take. I don't know if it's a good take. It's an interesting take. So Luther, even though he's seeing all this corruption, is trying to do his reform. It can't happen. He should have. He should have just laid down his life. Well, look. I, I'll if give it you, came to that, yeah. If I, I mean, there maybe are different he went, levels of martyrdom. There's confessors, people that like we were talking about Maximus the confessor earlier. Yeah, he was punished, but he didn't die. They yeah. cut his tongue out mm-hmm. for speaking the truth. So yeah, this this is an important story to tell yeah. because we have to give a counterexample. Mm-hmm. So so Saint Maximus the confessor, who's my namesake, like mm-hmm. that's my Orthodox name, mm-hmm. is one of the saints that is the the one of the most the strongest the strongest uh, let's say examples for for how I, I view Christianity. Mm-hmm. He came to a position where he was the only one with a certain theological position. And the, 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 the emperor brought him in front of him mm-hmm. and said, Maximus, everybody agrees with my position. Mm-hmm. The patriarch agrees. All these bishops agree. agree. And if we, if, we agree with, if we go with this position, we're going to reconcile mm-hmm. the Orthodox Church and the Coptic Church. We're going to mm-hmm. reconcile them. Mm-hmm. And he said, the only person that doesn't agree is you. Mm-hmm. And Maximus said, he said, if the entire universe agreed with you, mm-hmm. I would not agree with you. Mm. So the emperor cut his tongue out, mm. shipped him off into, into nowhere land, mm-hmm. and basically, you know, just l- waited for him to, to, to die. Mm-hmm. I think they cut his hand off, too. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Anyways, whatever. Yeah, because yeah, his pen. They, they did some bad pen stuff. pen was dangerous on um, Maximus' ultimately, confessor. Ultimately, Maximus' position would become the one of the entire church. Mm. Right? 
but he 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 didn't rebel. Mm -hmm. He didn't like decide that he's gonna he's gonna make this new church that he's gonna mm -hmm. do. And so then ultimately the fruits of his truth mm -hmm. came up later, mm -hmm. right? It's like he planted the right seed, mm -hmm. even though it cost him everything. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that that's what you're doing, then the fruits of that will become apparent. You have to trust that. And that is the trust of the martyrs, which is to say the emperor says he's gonna kill me. He's wrong. He's worshiping all these pagan gods. I know what's true, and I will stand by it. But I won't rebel against the authority that God has put uh, uh, above me. Interesting. Okay. So if Luther was a bishop, would you feel different about this? <laughs> That's a tough question. That's a tough question. Yeah. Would, if Luther was a bishop and he had his yeah. own arm and then he was just like, Catholic Church is wild, Right and like I'm going to assign priests. I think I think that's a. Is there a, pre a historical precedent where this happened somewhere else that maybe we don't have to talk about a hypothetical? Yeah. So we have a we have we have a precedent now. Okay. Um, which is that in the Orthodox Church right now mm -hmm. there exists something we call the old calendarists mm -hmm. in the Greek Church, and so they are considered schismatic, mm -hmm. but they're not considered heretics. Mm. Uh, and they and so they they basically at some point some bishops decided that they weren't going to accept the new calendar, mm -hmm. you know, because the the Orthodox Church shifted to the to the the uh, the uh, Gregorian calendar, mm -hmm. um, and so the way that most Orthodox view that is that they're kind of like we can't be in communion with them, mm -hmm. but we also kind of see them as cousins. Mm -hmm. And if ever that one theological thing was resolved, mm -hmm. we would be in communion with them immediately, mm -hmm. right? And so. It's it's still like a scandal in the church, sure. or something that's improper and, sure. and problematic. Uh, but I don't think that it would have been as serious as. But I mean, if if the thing is though, if Luther had been a bishop mm -hmm. and then he had gone to do the things he did, mm -hmm. which was to name priests, but then ultimately destroy all the monastic orders, mm -hmm. you know, force nuns to marry and like do all the crazy stuff that he did. Mm -hmm and ally himself with princes and basically go to war with 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 other Christians, mm -hmm. I think that then I would have said no, like yeah. obviously not. Mm -hmm. But if his original protest, mm -hmm. which was the protest against indulgences mm -hmm. and the protest against the corruption and the abuse of the church, that was a completely legitimate protest. I think that if he, if he had been able to stay in that and 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 even like then we wouldn't have all the yeah. we wouldn't have the, as many of the problems. What if Luther's there. reading the Bible and he's like first Peter all royal priesthood, all, we're all saints in Christ, right? And he's seeing all these things that if from his just plain reading of scripture, he yeah. doesn't see this, um, he doesn't see the same hierarchy, let's just say the same hierarchy that he sees in the Catholic church. And that is why he decides that the the, the, the church, the local ecclesia, mm. It doesn't have to have this hierarchical thing with a yeah. pope and all these bishops and all these different things. But, I mean, it's, well, it's yeah, well, he would have been. That. He wouldn't have been participating in the faith of the apostles. That would have been. Uh, but you guys already believe the Catholics weren't participating in the faith of the apostles. No, but they yeah, weren't yeah. completely. So, they also. It's like there's levels of distance, right? There's levels of 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 deviance. Mm -hmm. Like we all have some deviance mm -hmm. to some extent. Yeah, like yeah. in our lives, there's levels of deviance. Mm -hmm. It's not about like it's it's difficult when we just see things in black and white categories. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the best way to understand it is in is is in hierarchies of participation. Sure. And so there are le there are different levels of of deviance, and some are more serious and and have more repercussions yep. uh, as you play it. But in terms of Luther, you know, uh, first of all, I don't think that he he actually he believed that. But l the, what we call the radical reformers, mm -hmm. they they believe that, mm -hmm. like this idea of equality mm -hmm. in the church, because mm -hmm. Luther was in a was in a problematic situation because. Once he did that, he basically became a little tyrant, mm -hmm. which is that everybody referred to Luther, mm -hmm. and he decided everything. Mm -hmm. And he and he basically became a little pope mm -hmm. in his in his context, mm -hmm. which is which is which is actually the way revolution kinda, usually kind of ironic. Which yeah. it's, it's the way the revolution usually goes. Yeah, is that the person who caused the revolution becomes a tyrant yeah. after the revolution because yeah. they have to consolidate things. Sure. Yeah. But in terms of the idea of like of the priesthood of believers, mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to think about that and to look at why that what that verse means in scripture mm -hmm. because that verse in, in in peter is referring to a verse in the old testament mm -hmm. in which it says that israel is a nation of priests mm -hmm. and and now what peter's doing is applying it to christians he's mm -hmm. saying like israel was a nation of priests mm -hmm. so too now that is extended mm -hmm. to all those that enter into christ mm -hmm. they are now Israel mm -hmm. for all intents and mm -hmm. purposes. Um, but in the Old Testament, it didn't mean that everybody was a priest sure. in terms of function. Sure. Right. 
and the same for Christians. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like it, Christians are a nation of priests, but it mm-hmm. doesn't mean that within Every, everyone that, is literally a yeah. priest. I got yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So that that's I mean that's a really great example. So let's just take this into like a simpler way. Like maybe let's rewind back out to a point that everybody can agree on. This is a similar point. So I'm at church. Someone shows up. You know, someone brought their nephew back. Their nephew's in their twenties, and I start talking to him, and he's like, "Hey." Um, I ask him, "Hey, has Evan seen you around? Your, um, you know, your mother said you used to come here." And he's like, "Yeah, well, you know, I, Jesus is everywhere. I don't have to be in a church to have a relationship with him." And like immediately, like a lot of things come to mind because that's like, like I said earlier, that's not the faith of the apostles. Like the apostles didn't say you weren't going to be a part of a church. You know, there, there was no, there's no part in Scripture where it's like Christ is outside of the church. Mm-hmm. And and one of the silly like kind of Sunday school examples you can use of this is that you drink water. Water's mm-hmm. everywhere. But mm-hmm. you still put it in a cup, and you need clean water to drink. Sure. So the, one of the first things we ever learn about Christ as he, as on his own two feet and walking, is there's a there's a story when he's twelve, and in that story, uh, Mary and Joseph lose him in the city, and mm-hmm. they look around for him, and they find him in the synagogue, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house?" And so there is there's an aspect I understand that like, and most Christians can agree upon this is like, if you're wandering around looking for Jesus and avoiding church, like you're not going to find him out there, like you will in his father's house. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's an example of that. So when you get when people get into the flattening of the hierarchy, again, like you get back into like, well, that's not what was being taught, man. There's like a, there's uh, apostles, prophets, teachers, and shepherds. And we also see el- elders like have this massive role in the church. That's the, wor- the Greek word is the word we translate priest from. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that there's bishops. Now, people don't know what bishops mean when they see it. Mm-hmm. And I think that orthodoxy has a, a wonderful benefit is that it's we don't really believe in uh, sola scriptura, like the idea that it's just the Bible that we know about God. We have the scripture and the tradition. Yeah, that, 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 but that's not what sola scriptura is. No. Sola but, scriptura is that scripture is the only infallible authority. They're not the only authority because people who hold to sola scriptura still hold to creeds. They still hold to confessions. Yeah. So that's an easy straw man of sola scriptura. But that's, well, no, no one believes that about sola scriptura except yeah. like radical fundamentalists. They're okay, like, okay, okay, Bible let- alone, that's it. It's like it's just me and my Bible. No one, no real reasonable Protestant. Yeah, but I think the infallibility Scriptura. argument is just as is troublesome in the sense that I well, the only the... infallible authority, yeah. not not that because that, that's an important distinction. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, is God an infallible authority? Is God an infallible? Himself. No. Is na- well, no, no. God yeah, is. Yeah, God, yeah, sorry, yeah, God yeah, is. Does an God authority. reveal Himself in nature infallibly? Or is the fallibility come from the inability for us to translate what he's put there for us? Yeah, so it's a translation issue from nature. Yeah, right. So the the God where God is revealed, it's true. So mm-hmm. um, we we don't isolate that to um, a series of documents. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't put any less emphasis on scripture. Mm-hmm. But so, for example, if you were if you wanted to know what the priesthood was like in the Old Testament and a lot of the information is encoded, mm-hmm. but like specifics, like you would have known. To, where do we keep the robes? Mm-hmm. How do you cut the bull's throat or the or the goat's throat? <laughs> sure, like sure, sure. what we do with like you know exactly where does the blood go? Uh, <laughs> talk to Tony. <laughs> Tony knows. <laughs> Going all you know. into the sacrifice, right? So let's just say let's just take it like that. There there are things that you only knew orally, mm-hmm. or you know, mm-hmm. in, or in some other source than than scripture. So. So, for example, when you counter the word bishop in the Bible, there's not a lot of information about what a bishop is. Mm-hmm. But you start to read at you know very quickly how the bishops were functioning in the church, and you see the role of the bishop. So, if someone comes to me and says, "No, the uh, there is no hierarchy in the church; there are no clergy," it's like, well, we're not we're not talking about the same book anymore. Yeah, I understand why you don't know what to do with that, so you pencil over it. But mm-hmm. in the tradition, uh, you know. We we know what those roles were and what they were passed yeah. down. You see, yeah. like Saint Ignatius, like we're talking second century here, who's saying, you know, yeah, the bishop. He says the bishop is Christ to you. He's not saying the bishop is Christ, but he's saying if you think you're following Christ, but you're not following your bishop, then mm-hmm. like question yourself, right? right. It's like he is the authority that God has put over you, and he is Christ to you, right? And so it's like this is second century. This is like early, early. And so we already see that the that the that the ecclesiastical structure of the church is precedes uh, yeah. Nicaea. Like yeah, no, I I, I get it. I, th- I think I think what I'm what I'm getting at this two thoughts. I think I don't think Protestants are anti hierarchy. Like generally speaking, no, but they, they are. It's hard to say you what can't. all Protestants believe about anything because there's so many different fair, beliefs. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, fair I agree enough. with you on that. I'm, I'm with you there. And and two, this is how I think. I think we just continued on in your guys' tradition. I think you guys bounced, and we were like 500 years too late. That's what I think happened. 
Okay, so you're gonna to, he's gonna have to dig into that. I want to know. I was what gonna you mean. say like because I, I love when people find commonality. You guys saw the writing on the wall. I yeah, can explain. Yeah, yeah. You guys saw where things were going. Yeah, yeah. And you guys were like, "Yo, oh, no, this is you, there's too much consolidated power. You say you're about tradition, but you're not really about tradition. We got the real traditions that go back, right? Yeah. And I think till till this day, and, and and maybe I'm wrong, but if I look at the the, I think we have more doctrinal overlap than Protestants and Catholics, from my vantage point. It seems like when I hear you guys talk and I hear the, the emphasis on your essential doctrines, yeah. and I think of my essential doctrines, there's more overlap than when I'm talking to Trent Horn, who tells me, you know, hey, we don't pray to Mary, we ask Mary to pray for us. And I go, well, can I ask Charles Spurgeon to pray for me? And he goes, yeah, sure, you can ask Charles Spurgeon to pray for you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think there's, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, he, he said that. It was, really? Interesting. Yeah, totally, totally said that. He said, we don't, because we don't, because again, I don't want to steal, I don't want to straw man anyone. So I don't want to be like, Catholics pray to dead people, right? So yeah, when yeah. I ask a Catholic, he says, no, we ask them to pray for us. So yeah. I go, can I ask? So I, I make the point that I feel like there's, there seems to be more doctrinal overlap between Protestants and yeah, Orthodox. Yeah, right, but I think, I think you're... I well, think okay, you're, wait, hold on, hold on. Before we get into the differences, <laughs> yeah. I, I, want, I want to go with the similarities for a minute. All right, go for it. Because this is a fun category. Because So what happens all the time... So It's not the usual category. You know, go down. Well, you know, because in Orthodoxy, in a very general sense, I think he's right and when I looked at Catholicism, I saw purgatory, and I and I had a lot of biblical knowledge. I was like, "Where's purgatory? You know, where's limbo? Where are these things?" So, um, when it's like it says the elders are supposed to be the husband of one wife, and then their elders don't marry, like elder being the word for priest um, that they're uh, using. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're, like, you're making a really strong case. Keep going. Right. So <laughs> I can make your case for you here in a big way. So in the sense that I, when I looked at like when I when looked at Catholicism, and I had scripture, mm -hmm. and um, because Catholicism has something that Orthodoxy doesn't have in the sense that they have tradition and they have scripture, mm -hmm. but they have the magisterium, mm -hmm. which is like the Pope and these direct sure. authorities that sure. can change dogma. They um, have infallibility that they did not get until like 1850, sure. which I'm skeptical, talk about church tradition, of <laughs> any stream, and this is not to knock my Catholic brothers and sisters, I'm skeptical of Christians that hold newer doctrines yeah like rapture theology and dispensation dispensational rapture that's theology. a new one too so yeah. if you have papal authority which didn't come to to be until 1850 i'm just i'm sorry i'm looking at you side eye that's all i'm saying right so yeah so they add they kind of added that later go ahead i didn't mean so to no, no no you're, you're doing great it's your show man um <laughs> the uh i love your show i really I <laughs> look, at the, you, I look at the orthodox cross i told you they 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 flood my my chat with those <laughs> i want your channel so okay so even the stuff that when protestants totally balk at uh -huh. Like, um, totally balk at, they're actually participating in already mm -hmm. when they, they look at the Orthodox thing. So they're like, let's say in Orthodoxy, like there's this veneration of the saints. Mm -hmm. There's, um, and we believe that um, there are, that you, just like we pray, you're, you can ask a friend to pray for you. You can ask everybody who's in the church, living or dead, mm -hmm. that they're still participating in the church mm -hmm. because we believe that Christ is uh, the God of the living, mm -hmm. not the dead. Yeah, yeah. He says it himself. Same, same thing right. Trent Horn said to me. Okay, exactly. So, um, so Protestants look at that and they're like, oh, I don't know. And but they're actually already doing this themselves. They just don't know it. So how many books of the Bible did Christ write with his own hand? Take a pen out and write. None. None. Okay. So well, he's you know it depends how you look at it. right. Okay. I, well, I, you know again, <laughs> there's another way to say it. That's why yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. got really specific with his yeah. own hand in yeah, a pen. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Because hopefully, yeah. it's all him, right? Yeah. Um, so. I realized, like, as a Protestant, this is when I started to look at the early church, and there were things that made me balk because I had an allergic reaction to those things, almost because I, I really, in retrospect, uh, I was taught reactionary positions to those things as as groups were trying to separate themselves. So I, did, I realized one day, I was like, I'm literally going to St. Paul right now, reading 1 Corinthians. I'm asking him to show me what Christ showed him, right? So I'm giving Paul, like, I don't think I'm equal to Paul. Mm -hmm. I think he's someone above me I'm aiming at, right? I'm aiming, like, if I could become more like Paul, I would be more like Christ. Mm -hmm. So, as a Protestant, I was already doing these things, mm -hmm. that, but with the commonalities with Orthodoxy and Protestantism, a lot of times it just, Orthodoxy takes it farther. Mm -hmm. So, like, you'll take the the fact that, like, oh, the we, in the Gospels, we see the dead in Christ rise, mm -hmm. right, and give account. And we, we hear stories about these things, like the saints of old coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and the Orthodox Church, it was just a natural extension of this idea. In early Christianity, you see it right away, where when you look, let's say, you know, Mary, or in uh, the Orthodox Church, they'll call her the Theotokos, mm -hmm. um, you see an angel come and talk to her. Like, mm -hmm. go look in Scripture and find another angel that comes and addresses a person in that same way, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
it, there's there are special there are special roles, and so we believe that she's still participating, mm-hmm. even though her body is not walking around on Earth with us. Mm-hmm. That she's not limited because sure. she's alive sure. in Christ, and that these people that uh, that we look to, these saints of old, they are still participating with us in a in a very deep friendship. Fair enough. So um, so can we can can I extend that to Charles Spurgeon? I mean, it's not our problem. You want to? I mean, it, <laughs> it's like I'm not. I'm not. Here's how, here's how all prayer works. God doesn't answer prayers. You, that well, you got, are, so you're, are you kind of alluding to? And we ask Mary to pray for us. Yeah. But yeah. Let's so, think about it like this. Like, the thing is that you ask. It, it really is just an extension of mm-hmm. the prayer of the church, right? Mm-hmm. And so, can you ask? How can I say this? Can you ask the bank teller to pray for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. You mm-hmm. can ask the bank teller to pray mm-hmm. for you, but mm-hmm. I mean, you have very few little reason mm-hmm. to do that, mm-hmm. you know. But it's like you can you would you ask your your someone that has shown by his entire life unto his death mm-hmm. that he was faithful to Christ and that it you know it's like oh yeah I'll ask that person to pray mm-hmm. for me because mm-hmm. the prayer of the just is efficient like yeah. this is this pray, is pray promised of, to, a righteous man the, pay, the prayer yeah. of the righteous sure. is, is is efficient this yeah. is a, a promise that we have yeah. and so it is natural that people would end up asking mm-hmm. their the the people that have shown through the entire life mm-hmm. and up to their death that they're faithful mm-hmm. that we would ask them to pray for us mm-hmm. but it's like can you ask someone else to pray for you I mean. Sure, whatever. Like, I don't know. I mean, is it going to help you? I don't yeah, know. The connection matters. If they're yeah. part of the family, it matters. To some extent. You know, yeah. like, um, and I so, mean, there are some people that ask for their deceased family members to pray yeah. for them. Like, mm-hmm. I know that that's an unofficial practice that you find in the Orthodox tradition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's unofficial. It's it's kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, yeah. it's yeah. not, but it is something that happens. It, it, I'm just trying to make a connection between that there, there actually is more similarities between the idea that they do go to Scripture. Uh-huh. They want to know what Christ showed these people, mm-hmm. right? They're asking yeah. for help mm-hmm. from someone yeah. who lived a long time ago on mm-hmm. earth. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that the Orthodox position actually is just, okay, we'll keep, extend Scripture to that and apply Scripture to that. When when Jesus says to the apostles, they say, we've given up so much, mm-hmm. or the disciples at the time, we've given up so much, what do we get in return? He's mm-hmm. like, well, you're going to sit in the 12 thrones, mm-hmm. and you're going to judge these 12 tribes. Mm-hmm. He's talking about an active membership mm-hmm. as part of the church eternal. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, you know the church victorious. So he's uh, this idea isn't isn't as far for a Protestant who didn't grow up with it. It's not as far from Scripture as they think it sure, is. Sure. Right. I, I'm not even mad at the idea. Yeah. Like I'm because because again, even in this chat, which we have almost 600 people watching, there are people here saying, "Might as well consult a median. Why would you ask anybody to pray for you with Jesus?" Right. There's that, yeah, and I'm yeah. saying that's not what I hear from you guys, and that's not what I hear from Catholics. Neither of you guys are saying I'm praying to Mary. Right? No, but I mean, like, how can I say it? Pray pr- means ask. I, praying just means ask. Uh-huh. So when you ask someone to pray for you, you're praying. Uh-huh. Like, if I if I ask you to help me change my tire, I'm uh-huh. praying to you. Right? So we have to be careful that, okay. like, with that, what are we talking about when sure. we say these things? Sure. If I ask someone to help me, yeah. if I ask someone to, like, comfort me, if I ask someone to advise me, uh-huh. I am praying to them, okay? Mm-hmm. You don't have to go back far in time <laughs> to realize that's how the word is used in literature. Okay. I pray you, like... They speak the speech, I, you know, I pray you, <laughs> yeah. as I pronounce it to you, Shakespeare. So, um, the word pray is mm-hmm. is an ask, and so there are, there's obviously a very high version of that word, mm-hmm. right? And there there are, and in a very simple sense, it's a petition. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the problem that starts to fall apart when you, like, let's just say, oh, I don't need anybody to pray for me, or mm-hmm. I only go to Christ. Mm-hmm. The problem is God made a lot of people. Mm-hmm. He made a lot of people. And he put people in your life that you're not going to grow if you try to go around them. They're there for you, right? Mm-hmm. Like he, uh, you, you, there's there's a mockery when we when we think we can just depart. Like God gave us a way to mm-hmm. be in the church, and we can depart from that and mm-hmm. do fine. Mm-hmm. You're going to pay the consequence of whatever that is. Sure. Not God's not going to punish you. You're separating yourself from a good practice. So, okay. um, when it comes to when it comes to the fact that there's so many people, and if it's just you and Jesus, you're missing the communal aspect that God has distributed joyfully his good works to do to other Christians and believers. He's given me the duty and the responsibility to pray for you, and that those prayers are not, they're not just a play act. They matter and they move things. This is why whenever two or three or more, you know, are gathered together, Mm. that he's going to be there with us. So there's a sense in which, yes, God loves everybody, but the way most people see God's love is going to be through another person as a proxy for that love. So the entire reason there's so many people on the earth and Mm -hmm. there's so many Christians is because God is sharing this with so many people. Mm -hmm. So there is, there, there is a, a desire to want to make that. And I think people think they're making Christ most high when they say none of this other stuff matters. Cause there's a sense, like you said before, you can hate your mother and father and, 
it need, your your love for your mother and father needs to be like a hate compared to Christ, even mm-hmm. though God says honor your mother and father, mm-hmm. because there's an ontological consideration that Christ sure. is at the top, you know, sure. God's at the top. But all of these things below, we're we're behaving like Christ, mm-hmm. and that our job is just like that. So when a, when a when a pastor gets up and tells me I don't need these other things, mm-hmm. it's like oh, I don't need you either. Then mm. why do I need you to mediate? The Bible to me. Mm, why do I need you that's to? A good point. Why do you that's need to keep point. an eye on me? Yeah, like yeah. I got God. I got direct access to God. Mm-hmm. Why do I need you? So there's a there's a part of that that actually undermines. There's a part of that argumentation that I'm afraid that it undermines the the spark of divinity that's in all yeah. of us made in God's image. And, and it's also like it's more than that because well, not more, but I mean it's like there's also oh, this you. whole aspect. Sorry, I'm trying to outdo <laughs> you here. There's like there's this whole aspect which is that there's joy mm-hmm. because there's joy in the love of others. There's joy in the fact that we, it's like, so if you listen, if you, if you read one of the saint, uh, prayers to the saints, mm-hmm. the way they're usually formulated, mm-hmm. it's something like, we thank God for this saint. We thank God for the fact that this saint has revealed God to us. Mm-hmm. Then we ask the saint to pray for us. Mm-hmm. And then we ask God to save us through his prayers. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right, and so that whole system is to say that there is joy in understanding mm-hmm. that we participate in each other's mm-hmm. salvation. Mm-hmm. We are the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. We we are joined together in love, and we participate in each other's transformation, mm-hmm. in each other's salvation. And so I want you, I want God to use you in my life. I want to be God's vehicle for you in your life. Mm-hmm. That is actually how the kingdom of God appears in the world. Sure. And so it's like when we want to say like it's just me and Jesus and like I don't want to go to anybody besides Jesus, mm-hmm. we are removing the very like mechanism by which God is saving mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Anyways, that's that's how I see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so 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 tell me this distinction. When I when I'm reading the New Testament, it seems like the the body of believers is referred to as saints. Yes. Right? That we are all saints. Mm-hmm. That there's is it fair to say that within your guys' tradition that there is a capital S saint and then like a lower S saint, like meaning all three of us are lower S saints, but then there's capital S saints. Is that but there's it? there's just hierarchy in general is okay. the best way to understand it. It's okay. like the world lays itself out in these in these hierarchies. So that we the way that we recognize it, you think about it like people think about it too much like it's a formal process. Mm-hmm. Like the way that saints are recognized in the Orthodox Church is very organic. Like Someone, someone lives an ex- exceptional life, mm-hmm. full of grace, and usually, even towards the end of the, their lives, people can see in them like they're shining, they're glowing with the spirit of God, and that their 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 entire being is transformed. Mm-hmm. And then when they pass, it's like people want to remember them, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. and want to to tell other people about them. And there's this like there's this movement where it's like this person revealed God to us, mm-hmm. this person revealed God to us, and there's this joy, this celebration, and then. This is the mystery that a lot of the people won't believe is that then those people start to act again, mm. which is that people yeah. start to recognize them acting in the world again, that they're sitting in the divine council, mm-hmm. that they're one of those that are ruling with Christ. Mm. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, miracles start to happen. Oh, it's like I start to weird things start to happen where the saint is is still there. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, so and it's like. And then people recognize that. They're like, oh, this is amazing. And this is wonderful. Yeah. You know, this is a wonderful thing that this person that we've seen their whole life mm-hmm. being close to Christ is now still with us. And now we ask for him to pray for us. It's like this weird natural thing that just happens. Well, it's God's winning. He's like, you could say he's re- like, there's there's some takes. It's like he's replaced all these angels that fell mm-hmm. are being replaced, you know, as he lifts mankind up towards himself. Um, I've heard that as well. But there's so many there's so many different ways to talk about this, but I think that um, I think most Protestants would be surprised to know that most of the reformers were closer to our position on this. So when you, you talk about the Mother of Christ, mm-hmm. yeah, Luther uh, had Luther, deep veneration, and, 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 and even and even John Calvin in this. Like I mean, they they had there were differences in how they talked about it, but you know when it came to like communion was. Mm-hmm was a God's energy filled communion. They didn't mm-hmm. believe it was merely symbolic. Mm-hmm. Like you'll go places now and they'll talk about this as a symbol. Like mm-hmm. they'll take the word remembrance to mean something, you know, um, something thinner or yeah. just a, pre- it's a, sure. it's a representation of something sure. Sure. where people, Christianity seemed to u- unanimously believe for, you know, 1500 years that it was, uh, it was a, not a representation, but it was a presentation. There was, so, there's something there in, in the sacrament of communion. There's something, I don't want to use the word magical, but there's something there that's not just symbolic. 
Right, exactly. Yeah. And so, and you know, when, when Christ also answers the questions about what, as saints, we could become, we become sons of God equal to angels. Sons mm-hmm. of God in the Bible is a rank of angels. Mm-hmm. And there's this there's this moving up that happens um, that's so lovely. So we, we pay a price. We pay a price when we flatten things out too much, you know, because— You get, you get too egalitarian. Yeah, well, too, also there, that there's—we're shaped for those things to be in our life. We're mm-hmm. shaped to live in a world with these things like angels— like saints above us, it, because and because when we don't have those things, we don't have the right thing to look to. Now, the, like the word saint etymologically is very close to the word star. Well, what happens uh, in the West as more and more of the traditions start to vacate Christianity of the saints, of the sacraments, mm-hmm. well, you end up with celebrities, yeah, politicians, yeah. right? That's, that's fair. And so— and and people venerate them like people. Well, we who, literally call them idols. We call yeah. them stars. We call them all the language of the of the ancient gods. So it's funny because like I don't want to be I don't want to be like the the thing I'm pushing back against is the thing I, I experienced and was for a long time. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm I have like it's, I'm never looking down on someone else when I'm pushing back. I'm just trying to let them in on like what the you, the the restaurant you're at and the food you're eating and how and how amazing it's serving you. Um, because, like, all the things, like iconography, so one of the funny things, when I first became Orthodox, I have a friend, I won't say his name, he's probably watching, he likes your channel, he's a worship leader, uh, not a worship leader, a worship artist in Nashville, <laughs> and I told him about Orthodox, he's like, oh man, that's kind of gross. I was like, what do you mean gross? He's like, oh, the icons, dude, you guys are venerating these pictures and stuff like that, and worshiping icons, I'm like, we don't worship icons, like, I used the word venerate, he didn't mm-hmm. use the word venerate, I said, no, we venerate icons, we're not, like, worshiping them like they're the angel of the Lord, or or God or something like that. And he's, I'm like, well, so we, we talk for a minute and he's, I'm like, well, what are you up to today? He's like, oh dude, I'm shooting a worship, uh, a worship video. Mm-hmm. And I said, bro, like, what's the worship video? Yeah. Well, it's me worshiping. People are going to, you know, watch and worship. I said, like, that sounds a little worse than what you just said I was doing. <laughs> There's going to be a camera on me and I'm going to be jumping around with a guitar and, and lip singing my gospel song. And worship. <laughs> like, I know that he's supposed to be a through point, but at the same time, he understands that like, like there's images everywhere. If you yeah. don't have holy images, you don't have images that are participating in the highest things. Yeah. You get stuck with lower images. Sure. And what images are these? Instagram. Like, yeah. what are you looking at? Yeah. What are you? What are you putting your eyes on? So mm. yeah, um, that's interesting. That's good. Um, shout out to who just gave a super chat. Caleb Woods just gave a super chat. Appreciate you. Okay, um, Mary, Jesus. Did Jesus have brothers, or was Mary a perpetual? Virgin, virgin. Mm-hmm. Um, guess. And, and I guess, and or was she? Guess uh, that our answer. Was she? Uh, <laughs> did she? Did she have other kids after yeah, Jesus? No. the The tradition, the 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 Orthodox tradition is that she didn't. And okay, that, so so when you so you guys hold the same view as Catholics yeah. that when Jesus' brothers are coming or whatever that 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 word is cousin. Yeah, it's not or brother. half brother. Half brother. Because, oh, it can mean brother. Yeah, it can also yeah. mean brother. Okay. But that, um, but that they are not the children of Mary, and that they are either the children of Joseph mm-hmm. from a previous marriage, because mm-hmm. a lot of the the tradition shows Joseph to be an older man, mm-hmm. which is also why he disappears in the Bible story. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like we don't even know what happens to him. At some point, he's gone. It's like it's so. Like, so so Joseph marries Mary. Yeah, she yeah. gives birth to Jesus, and he never consummates. Well, the well no. Here's how the story. Well, so uh, you, in your tradition, you came from. Do you know the name of Mary's parents? No, because they're not. It's not recorded in scripture. Okay. Um, Joachim and Anna. Okay. Um, and so uh, Mary was dedicated to the temple mm-hmm. as a temple virgin. Uh, I don't know if that's the right name for the category. Um, Jonathan's just gonna he'll throw something at me if I messed up the details too much. But anyway, um, it was traditional when they when they came of age they couldn't stay and serve. Mm-hmm. So they would you got to find someone to take care of her. Joseph mm-hmm. is a is a widower, mm-hmm. uh, much older than her. He's not around for long in the story. Mm-hmm. By the the time where Jesus is twelve is the last time we we see from Joseph. Um, so this is this is an older man who has children that are older than Mary, mm-hmm. right? And he's he's taking her in like it's a husband, but he's a, her, he's her caretaker. Um, I don't think that too. I think that there's this weird way we have of looking at um, sexuality since we've had birth control too, where it's kind of like you know whenever it's available all the time. There's sure. no, uh, but in the in the you know in the ancient world it wasn't seen as like something that was just for pleasure unless yeah. you wanted to have some serious consequences from that too. So it's if we put ourselves back in the mindset, imagine this. Imagine just even let's imagine she's not inspired by the Holy Spirit to stay a virgin. 
you're the only virgin mother uh-huh. in existence. Uh-huh. Let's just get rid of that so I can, you know, yeah. have sex. Well, and, and the thing it's, is, it's, 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 I mean, but the thing, I, I hear you. you. No, I, hear you. I just think it's I think, also, I, I think it's ahead. important to understand that in the same way that you can say, well, there's this verse uh-huh. in the Bible sure. that says that, that Jesus's brothers were uh-huh. there. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing is, in the end, mm-hmm. it never says in the scripture that she had other children. It doesn't Fair say enough. that Fair once. Enough. Yeah, right? yeah. Once. And yeah. then second of all, it is true that that word can also mean cousin. Mm-hmm. And so if you go back a thousand years after everybody has accepted that, mm-hmm. that, 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 that the, the virgin was a perpetual virgin, you mm-hmm. go back and you say, well, you know what? We're going to go back in there and we're mm-hmm. going to reinterpret this text mm-hmm. yeah. to say that this is what it means. Mm-hmm. When now for a thousand years, the church has said that it's like, this is a perfectly legitimate mm-hmm. reading of the text. Mm-hmm. And this is the one that is backed by the tradition that the apostles had heard mm-hmm. of the, the the things that they knew that, mm-hmm. you know, because the, the virgin continued to be part of the early church. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's like, I don't know what to tell you. It's like, we could argue about it, mm-hmm. but th- there's no more... There's no more in the scripture yeah. to say that she had children. No, I, you, I, th- I think bo- both sides are arguing from silence. Yeah, and on but this the thing issue. is that why? Okay, except well, well why, sure, why would you change it? Like that's a, the, this opinion. is the big thing. Like why would you decide at some point to change that? Mm-hmm. Well, like, what, I, I, what, did, what I didn't is, change it. No, but what I mean Ruslan, is that, <laughs> how dare yeah, you? Yeah, but what what I mean is that what is the motivation? <laughs> uh-huh. What is the desire uh-huh. to remove from her this part of the story that the church had accepted? Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what uh, is I mean, motivating it? I don't. I don't totally understand. Yeah. yeah. It. I, I don't know if there's anything motivating it. Um, it's the whole like don't ascribe malicious intent to which could be explained with incompetence thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I don't think there's anything okay. like I don't think there's a malicious uh, desire to smear the legacy of Mary. I'll be honest. I think Protestants don't hold Mary in the highest regard, mm-hmm. or in the in the regard that we should. Right. And I think both sides are kind of arguing from silence in terms of scripture. You guys are pointing to tradition. Fair enough. I think. Uh, I think that if so, again. If Luther, the reformers are just taking a plain reading of scripture and they're going, oh, Jesus had brothers. Yeah, well, Luther definitely believed in the perpetual virginity of the. Of he the, did yeah, believe yeah, that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Th- that, okay. that so, came so, much so then later. educate yeah. me. So then when did it change? I don't know who is the first one to, to okay. propose okay, something so different. There, there's a lot of changes to me that. Um, so, you, okay, so you, you grow up. I, I grew up Catholic mm-hmm. at first, right? Um, my family, uh, my mom sang at church. We weren't the most devout Catholics ever. By the time I, it was time to get confirmed, I was like, I don't know if I believe this stuff. Mm-hmm. I had no, I never was an atheist at any point. It, mm-hmm. it didn't, it, it never seemed like a reasonable proposition that, mm-hmm. that this all came from nothing. So uh, I never was tempted into atheism. But, um, you know, I started going to, I started going to a Protestant church. My uncle ran, mm-hmm. and I was curious about who Mary was to us now. Like, okay, so we had all this other stuff. What of this do we reject? What do we not? Because our church isn't beautiful like the church I was going to. It was like, you know, we were in um, a very mo- modern space. And mm-hmm. uh, so when I asked about it, the first thing someone told me was like, oh, she's a regular lady like you and I. Yeah. Like, not that I was a lady. But um, <laughs> I was like, that's a, like, and as a 16-year-old kid, I was like, that's a weird thing to tell me first about someone because at least was savvy enough at the time to realize that's a reactionary statement. In other mm-hmm. words, they she knew I was Catholic, the lady telling me this, mm-hmm. and she was basically like letting me know, oh, not the Catholic thing. Mm-hmm. That's why she was doing that, right? So uh, there, there's a lot of things. So what happens is this happens to, um, you know, so people in uh, Calvinist who really push back against Pentecostalism, mm-hmm. right? So they don't like Pentecostalism, so they end up looking, they look at seeing, seeing things getting abused, and the there's two ways to handle with something being abused. It's like maybe there's a right way to do this thing and they're just doing it the wrong way. Or, you know what, maybe that thing is too tricky and we just throw it out altogether. So now tongues don't exist. Mm-hmm. Like there's no there's no tongues. There's no gifts of the spirit or whatever. Because why? Because it's a reactionary position to the people that abuse it. It's an overcorrection. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, but right. this is, I mean, it's important because the 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 reaction that Mary has to the announcement that she is going to give birth to Christ mm-hmm. is one of the most beautiful hymns Amen. in the Bible. Amen. But I've never heard it sung once in my life in a Protestant church. Uh, we, sing, we sing uh, it around the Christmas all the, all the time. Uh, I've never. You heard can it. look it up, Kate. Well, all right. Kate I, wrote a I song will. I will with her friend Rebecca. It's huge. Just you, you, some people in chat. Give me some shout outs if you know the song. He who is mighty. It's. We it's it does really well, but Shout she out wrote to the you song. For, All right, for I will take that man. back. Let's I will go. take that back. I will take it back. <laughs> well, I'm gonna be honest either way. Okay. I mean, I, I will agree. More. I think 
it sounds like the Protestants overcorrected on Mary, or some Protestants did, even though Luther, you said, viewed her as a perpetual virgin. Well, how many virgin mothers are there? F- fair enough. This is one. Um, it's two ca- two ca- uh, categories that can't <laughs> exist at the same time that are both absolutely there's, pure there's, and beautiful Because there's something deeper happening, and this is difficult. This is a more difficult uh, argument, but w- the one of the reasons why Mary is a perpetual virgin is mm-hmm. also because she is the... Wa- waters in genesis one that is she is manifesting at an individual level mm. what it is that the the waters from the very beginning were manifesting mm. at the outset okay mm-hmm. and so if you understand what the name of mary means which is which means bitter it mm-hmm. means mara mm-hmm. and it's related to the idea of the waters that are presented in scripture from mm-hmm. genesis one to Exodus, when the the Israelites encounter the bitter waters and the tree is placed into the bitter waters and mm-hmm. makes them sweet, mm-hmm. right? This is the image of the. Is that these are preludes to the incarnation. Okay, mm-hmm. and so the fact that Mary is represented in the tradition as a perpetual virgin mm-hmm. is also because of that very deep insight that she is connecting this idea of the lower waters with the spirit that comes down on the mm-hmm. lower waters. Mm-hmm. What did the angel say? He mm-hmm. said, you know, you will have a child by the virtue of the spirit. Mm-hmm. This is literally going back to Genesis 1 mm-hmm. yeah. and saying you will be like the new creation. Mm-hmm. Like you will bring about a new creation in your womb. And so the 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 the, the fact that we use that is not just an arbitrary thing to make her special and to make her like but it is a deep pattern in scripture which is there from the beginning and manifests itself all the way tr- through mm-hmm. until you 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 get this new creation in the incarnation mm-hmm. and we use the same imagery because mm-hmm. her name is literally the same as what was there mm-hmm. from the outset and just move through and that is how the the church fathers read scripture as well mm-hmm. uh and so it's not just like oh so let's make her perpetual virgin to make her special or yeah. to make her some kind of freak thing it's like no this is a deep scriptural pattern mm-hmm. that is there from the beginning interesting okay fair enough um a uh, quick shout out to uh ryan mc who dropped the super chat on us he said hot take <sighs> this is he's just he's spot on i've always thought orthodox art is beautiful and straight fire i feel protestants have neglected the visual arts um, in his in his name, where music takes center stage in most worship, I think we would probably all agree with that statement. Um, yeah, there's something really. By the way, I didn't call Mary the Holy Spirit. Whoever said that is ridiculous. Pe- pe- people in the chat get weird. Yeah, no, so. like, oh yeah, I know. Yeah, last for yeah. me to call Mary. That's yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous. That's what that it's for like us. my goodness. Yeah, that, thank you for the to super hear chat. That, to hear is, that, guys, this is what, this is why we have conversations yeah. and we're friends. Like, and I enjoyed our time because it's clarity leads to confidence and context. Mm-hmm. And so if we're just uh, 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 straw manning other people's that, that's silly right this is why we, we talk about these, and I don't think either of you guys have called Mary the Holy Spirit no, she, or worship. she's Mary. the waters on which the Holy Spirit descended yes. not, she's not the Holy Spirit yes. I don't yes. think anybody so there's um, I, I love that like, just in that I want to address that super chat actually can I yeah, yeah. please because I think it's beautiful what he's saying so there, there's um, beauty matters right so you can't Christ says behold I'm making all things new mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean that the world needs to be boring so it's just something spiritual like he's literally he resurrects your body Mm -hmm. like your body is part of a resurrection your body is going to be restored all of this is going to be brought up and and made better um and and we're going to see it as it really was meant to be so there's um something that was very challenging for me all as an artist is that okay so let's just take uh, what, what was happening is i'm in a band and i'm traveling the country and uh, I'm a Christian. Our band's not a Christian band, but you you travel along and you see a billboard, mm-hmm. and you're driving through Tennessee and you see a billboard, and it's for a Christian radio station, and their advertisement for their music is safe for little ears, <laughs> right? That was like what it had been reduced to, and I was like, oh, that's not a good plan. Like you know, so part of the thing is this was the thing when you worked. Uh, I worked with Walden Media a little bit um, on uh, a couple of films, helping them market them, and. Those who don't know, Walden Media are the people that the made Narnia. the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah, they yeah. were working they were like on a, because of they were like Dixie a Christian, like at a Christian. The time. So the important, company. the important governing aspect we were working on is the idea that kid stories aren't kid stories because of what you took out of them. They're a kid story because of what you put into them, mm. right? And so Christian music very often can be like, well, we don't want confusion, we don't want riddles, we want clarity, and we, uh, you know, so they end up taking out a lot of stuff. So they copy. They copy stuff. So, like, you know, when the worship band was copying U2 in, like, 2004, U2 was better. Oh, you bet. Yeah. U2 yeah. was way better. It's yeah. like when they started copying Coldplay, it's like, 
Coldplay is still better. Okay, so what we ended up having for a long time in our art in the West was something like Diet Coke. It's not going to make you fat, but it's got a weird aftertaste. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? Amen. No, did, you're, did you're not. This is why I'm like, yo, you guys, you got it. This okay. Is no pushback for me. Here's yeah, right? what I started noticing because there was something I found myself like Judas criticizing the beautiful churches, though, where I was like, isn't that money wasted? Mm. Right? Isn't that money wasted? Couldn't we spend that on the poor? Couldn't we spend that else better? And it's like, no, it's still spent on God. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, but I also realized as working for churches and stuff, and you would just, you would love to have. An intellectual atheist wander in one day and be like, I'm a Christian now. Thanks, guys, for building this ministry here and whatnot. It would never happen. I'm sure people have stories of where it happened. At the same time, I started noticing that atheists were paying top dollar to go over to Europe mm -hmm. and to go over, uh, you know, into Greece to tour churches and monasteries. <laughs> and I was Jeez. like, dude, we totally blew it. Mm. We went four walls in a gospel and we didn't realize that like all of this stuff can participate yeah. in God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's so that's one of the, the things about the tradition. I encourage that for everybody. It's like you have, if you, if you understand this worldview and what you have access to the, uh, like you have access to more yeah. than yeah. the people who are beating us yeah, at yeah, art. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, and, so oh, here's, man. here's what I will unapologetically acknowledge you guys are some of the most creative people I know. I right, thank you. Yet you guys still color within the lines of, of what we call orthodoxy, sure. right? Like Small doctrinally, light. conservatively, doctrinally, but also like mar what marriage is, mm. what marriage is not, yeah. right? Like what a man is, what a woman is not, yeah. right? We don't have to go there. But um, what I find is the people who make art at your guys' caliber, caliber, not all of them, but a lot of them, the, in the Protestant arm of the church, tend to deconstruct and become mm. like progressive Christians or not Christian at all. Oh, I know, right? I know, right? I know who you're talking about. And, 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 so, and so that's why I think this is a W, there's mm. no pushback for me. I think everything you're saying is spot on. Yeah. I think that there is an issue with Christian art. I've been saying this for a long time. And I, when you get, a, when I get around people as creative as you guys, your graphic illustration, stories, icons, music, theatrical, incredible, you know, riddles, amazing those people end up becoming weirdos like in every measurable word in the mm. protestant art like they're just they're just freaking weird i don't want to be around them they're jerks they're, they're, they're like and or they believe some crazy stuff and i got stories for days we don't want to so i'm 100 yeah, 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 with yeah. you guys yeah. and i think and i think i said this you guys i think there is some something in the theology there that yeah, yeah, yeah. allows for more freedom but i think there's also like there's something that at least for the artists that are watching now if there's some artists watching now yeah. it's like the i'm the laying the bible I'm going to tell you this right away. The Bible is the best inspiration for art yeah. that ever existed. Yes. And the problem, the reason why it's not for most people is because they just take it as moral guidance. Mm, right. Yeah, it, yeah. It's like because they take it as moral guidance, they they cannot see the language of scripture mm -hmm. in how much of, of its poetry, mm -hmm. of the fact of, of the analogies that it creates, the type of meaning making that it engages with, you know, the type of structures that it lays out in mm -hmm. the stories and mm -hmm. in the even like visual structures that it lays out mm -hmm. when it describes the temple and the tabernacle yeah, and all yeah. this stuff. It's like the, the 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 Bible is one of the most profound sources of inspiration you could find if you approach it in the right in the right vein. And mm -hmm. I think that that is something that both Neil and I have kind of understood and and so what happens is that if you if you enter into scripture that way you know it will reveal to you the structures of reality mm -hmm. like right. it, it it'll show you, you how to see it. it'll show you how to see the world mm -hmm. and then out of that you know some of the most beautiful art in the history of the world was made whether it is dante's you know uh, comedy whether it is the 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 amazing churches that were made the mosaics mm -hmm. all of this stuff and the hypnography of the church it's like we've thrown it all out, mm -hmm. but they're like, I'll give you an example for people watching. There's a poem right, called The Hymns on Paradise mm -hmm. by Ephraim of the Syrian, St. Ephraim the Syrian, fourth century saint, wrote a, wrote a poem on paradise that will just like, it's amazing. It's astounding. Mm -hmm. it, it, di it dives into the story of Genesis, of the first chapter of Genesis, connects them to the flood, to, to Exodus, to Christ, mm -hmm. does it in the most beautiful, succinct way you can do. And that's just one book. Mm -hmm. All of the hymnography of the church has this powerful language of analogy and of, and of, of representation. And it's like, we just threw it all out. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's, it's available to us. It's like, it's all there. Yeah. Fair enough. No pushback for me. Let's hit some of these super <laughs> chats real quick. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could talk about this stuff. For 
forever. We'll probably keep um, talking about it for the Jasmine rest of the day. said, what do you guys think about the statements that Mary is the mother of God and the queen of queen of heaven? Now, from my understanding, and you guys push back, I feel like this the 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 church fathers have been calling her the mother of God. Yeah. And and even the early reformers had a very high view of yeah. Mary. And that's re- that's again, I'm skeptical of anything. No, that's I can recent. explain I can explain it to people that they'll definitely understand it. One of the problems is also because of the way we we understand categories in the modern world. Mm-hmm. So the word mother, as you know, is related to the word matter, right? It's these are the same words, yeah, okay? The etymology, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it's related to this idea of this lower waters that I talked about, mm-hmm. right? So God, God sends His Spirit down, mm-hmm. and then pulls the earth out of the lower waters, right? Mm-hmm. It's out of the chaos that God pulls out reality. Mm-hmm. Okay, that is the prime matter you could call it, right? The 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 the, the lower this lower kind of potential out of which the body is taken. Mm-hmm. And that well, is just, the. Uh, I give people a real grounded example of that. This is less abstract, like in the sense that when you have, um, when a baby's born, the water comes first, mm. right? It's seen as like the primordial. It's seen as the potentiality of life, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, that's just uh, something everybody understands. Yeah. Um, sometimes these categories. And so the thing is that so like in a, in a in a in a sexual relationship, the the father provides the seed, mm-hmm. right? Very little body. There's no body. Mm-hmm. The body comes from the mother, mm-hmm. right? The whole body of a child comes from the mother, mm-hmm. right? That is what we mean by the mother of God. What we mean mm-hmm. by the mother of God is we mean the one who provided a body for God. Mm-hmm. The one, out, of, it, out of her body that God was revealed to the world. It doesn't mean that we're making her superior to God in any way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that we're, that we're making her equal to God. Mm-hmm. It just means that, like the, analog- like the scriptural analogy of understanding, this idea that God sends his logos, think about it this way in Genesis 1, God speaks, sends his logos down, and then that logos pulls the earth out of the waters. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? And that is what happens with Mary, is that Christ, God sends his logos down with his spirit to Mary, and then in in her womb, a body is formed, and it rises up out of her womb. And so that is what we mean by when we say mother of God. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, but too, like that incarnational pattern is how everything comes into being. There's a pattern and it has to gather matter. So like these, like the, even the, in Greek, like the word for father is is the same pattern. The yeah. same word as pattern. The same mm-hmm. word for mother is matter. This mm-hmm. is almost every language is that there's a pattern that men apply and that it finds its matter and they join and mm-hmm. you have life and you have um, incarnation. So mm-hmm. in the very first thing, uh, very first creation of man with mm-hmm. Adam, you have God speak, breathing into like general dirt, just dirt on the earth, right? By the time we get to the incarnation of Christ, when man is created, um, you know, there's an orthodox expression I heard thrown around that it was like God created man in 33 AD, Mm -hmm. just like Christ was crucified before the foundations of the earth, Um, is that this idea that like now instead of just sort of dirt in the earth, you have something that's come up from that dirt closer to heaven, right? A pure body, like Mary is the exemplar of purity, in this situation. So, and then you have God providing the spirit of, you know, his spirit to the situation. So this, this is also like the idea, if you, people want to ponder the mystery of that thing, about where Christ comes from, and th- you can think about that moment of how Christ comes into the world and is conceived as in every act you take, that you're always trying to combine the right matter and practices with the proper name and spirit down uh, down from heaven. So in this story isn't just historical details. Mm-hmm. In in the story is how to look at everything you do mm-hmm. and say in every action. So uh, it's it's very personal at the same time as it's this huge cosmic image of mm-hmm. of Christ coming to the world. It's very personal in the sense that you're gonna you're supposed to go and reenact that story. All the time. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, quick, quick super chat. Uh, this is for you, Jonathan. Love to see Jonathan on here. He's a big reason I've gone from atheism to orthodox. Praise God. Yeah, glory to God. That's awesome. I hear that a lot, man. That's awesome. I hear that a lot. That's awesome. Okay, uh, chat. If you guys got other questions, drop them in the chat now. Specific questions. Somebody brought up Matthew one twenty five, where it said Joseph hadn't been with Mary until. That's a good verse to bring up because yeah. it's it really. Um, uh, you, you, from, if you're reading Protestantism into it, it seems like a, uh, it seems like the nail in the coffin. It's where it's talking about how um, he did not sleep with her until, until the time when Christ was yeah. born. That fe- everybody feels like that inferentially, that's like the end of the argument. Yeah. 
And uh, there's tons of examples. I can, we can just start going through Scripture where it says things like that, and you don't believe that suddenly afterwards the thing that was excluded up until that point starts to happen. It doesn't infer. I mean, but he yeah. did not consummate their marriage until, until she gave birth to a son, yes. and he gave him the name Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, I mean, you can give the exa- I don't know the examples, but I know I ha- I have read about this where <laughs> that that until does not like in the Greek yeah, does not just, imply that he did afterwards. Yeah, he did afterwards. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. The important thing was. It's, that it's, the, it, you, the, so you guys would say that's another argument from silence. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Fair enough. Um, it's a good verse, but yeah, I guess I'm I'm not that hip to the, to the Hebrew. Oh, it's really a really Greek. important verse. I think it's, I'm glad it's there. Um, I just don't think it makes the. It's not. It's not a uh, knockdown point to what everyone seemed to believe about Mary at the very early church, you know? So one of the things is, like, someone will come into me and they'll be like, I don't even know if there's there's any historicity to Christ actually existing. It's like, I understand how you can say that, you know, 2,000 years later. Sure. But, like, um, you know, when Christ conquers the Roman Empire from the inside out after 300 years, yeah. everybody around the time was acting like this was real and that started right away this whole this, this whole belief system so the idea historically someone can look back and be like hey you know mm-hmm. that's not what happened uh, i don't even think christ was a real person mm-hmm. except for the fact that the whole world was transformed and in, in changed by the person Dude, you man. don't think did it didn't no, exist like, so and 30 years evidence? 30 years after 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 christ's uh, resurrection nero was already persecuting christians in rome yeah, yeah. Like, at least so, they believed there was something real there and they're dying yeah. for their faith so like the I, idea but the, some of these ideas are 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 hard for me to swallow. They're easy to make from a, a long distance, but because uh, we'll put modern expectations on the story and modern like yokes on the meanings of the words, but the, it doesn't. Things yeah. change over time too. Yeah, I think there's a great apologetics argument from church history when you just look at timelines and how much the gospel actually changed everything after it, right? Yeah. So I think it's important to know these things, and, 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 and that is one of those things that, as a, as a Protestant, I feel like most Protestants have a lower view of church history and church tradition than I, than I like, than I enjoy, right? Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think there's so much there, just understanding um, when they started meeting in buildings, the persecution they went through, how they slowly won over the, the people around them that weren't followers. You know, all these things, it's like so fascinating from church history. Let me hit some of these super chats. We're going to start wrapping it up soon. Onyx said, I was raised Catholic, never confirmed, but now I'm uh, an Orthodox inquirer. What knowledge should I gain before becoming a catech- catechumen? Catechumen. What knowledge should he acquire? I mean, the, a catechumen is where you start to acquire knowledge. So, I mean, pretty much you should, you should, yeah, you should become a catechumen if and and then the the priest will take you along that road to knowledge. It's it's the best way to do it if you can, especially if you can have a priest that will mm-hmm. kind of catechize you and give you that training. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to acquire any knowledge before becoming a catechumen. You can drop out at any rate if you if you if you realize that that, that you don't think this is the right path. Yeah, you know what's helpful for me. So um, it took a lot for me to actually step into an Orthodox church. Again, I had like allergic reactions to certain aspects of it, but I got to the point where all my YouTube feed. Outside of Ruslan, no, I don't think you were on the, the tube at the time. Uh, we're we're Orthodox. I didn't mean mm. for it to happen. It was just the things, the typology, the symbolism in Scripture. Like people were talking about it. Um, you know, yeah, you had like, a, like a natural insight into biblical symbolism. And, and so, yeah, that was always my thing. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find outside of like maybe some Anglican people like Alistair Roberts or people mm. like James Jordan. Uh, it didn't seem like outside of orthodoxy there was much thought on the the typological cosmic patterns in the Bible that I think are that are, that were just so as an artist were mm. like I was eat up with these things and so um, the important thing I did before I went to an orthodox church is uh, it's it's like cool if you read the services before you go because mm-hmm. there's so much lay, layered language and poetry and beauty and the prayers the prayers have this architecture to them where they come from above and they come down and they fill the earth. If you look at the pattern that's happening in the prayers, there is this structure that if I was just there and I was trying to keep up, I never would yeah, have saw it, tough. right? But because I kind of read it ahead mm. of time and I went there and I happened to go to this church called St. Michael in Louisville and their choir is so beautiful and their church is so beautiful. Like I was there and I never had so much meaning hit me at one time in a service because, again, someone It's overwhelming. It's sure. symbolism. It's like nobody is... They're not taking a minute off on infusing Christ and the, trin- the Trinity into everything. So, like, you make the sign of the cross, and, and Catholics have something similar to this, but, you know, you hold these three fingers together for the, um, the three persons of the Trinity, and you have these two fingers for the two natures of Christ, and when you make the sign of the cross, um, like, each of these patterns, you know, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like, you think about how... 
you think about even in the Epiphany how um, how the Trinity appears with the with the dove spreading out its wings into the world and how the spirit wind fills the earth. There were so many layers of symbolism. It was like a super saturated solution. I just like I cried like Jordan Peterson, like talking about how much men are moved by what he's saying. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, I it, was, it really hit me. So I mean, if you want if you want to find the most of God in it through this process is. Every time you're about to do something, like just do yourself a favor, get acclimated before you're there so you're not lost. And I think that's that's helpful because orthodoxy in a big way for like a lot of people that aren't converts that are bringing you into it, they just throw you into it's it. Like, it's like, they yeah, like it's, definitely drinking from, it's definitely drinking from a fire hose, that's mm -hmm. for sure. It's like imagine trying to like play baseball and no one explained to you the order of the bases or how the game works. It's like it's, it would be totally insane. And so a lot of people's experience into orthodoxy like that, is like yeah. that. It's just like, hey, you're, you'll go stand over there and field the balls that come to you. It's going to be fine. So <laughs> reading the services ahead of time is the very least thing you can do in trying to understand them. All right, let's hit a couple of these super chats. Um, and, and guys, hey, be nice to each other in the chat, please. Don't like if we can sit here and, and be friends and have a great conversation. You guys should be able to be nice to each other in the chat um, yeah. to people you don't know. Uh, Aaron asked, "What is the Orthodox take on the end times? Is it similar to Protestantism, or uh, are there any differences, similarities? If so, what are they?" So. In times, a lot of Protestants believe in a rapture theology. A lot of evangelicals believe in a rapture theology, though there are— folks... Too new for you, though, right? Say it again? Is that too new for too, you? Too new for me. Too, too new. new for me. I, I mean— 19th like, century. I don't know. I don't know what—I don't know how it's going to end. I don't—I don't—I I don't know. I don't take a strong confidence in any position. I want post-millennialism to be true. I want the church— um, converting the world and making the world more Christianized to be true and then revival breaking out and then Jesus come back. That, that's what I would like to see, um, which is in the line of like a Joel Webin and, and, and some of those folks. But I don't I don't know. I don't I don't have a strong position on this. It, uh, you guys are all millennial, right? Like already but not yet. Jesus is reigning. We're not going to put a name on it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, for my research, I think you guys are... are yeah, are, that's a Protestant. That's a definitely yeah. a Protestant name on what... what okay, so how does the end times you, play I out? You, you uh, I want, Jonathan just did a, a series for the Daily Wire oh. called The End of the World. Did you get... I haven't listened through it yet. Is yeah, that but on I YouTube don't, I don't, or is I don't, that uh, behind a paywall? It's, uh, it's behind a paywall on the Daily Wire, sadly. Ooh. But I don't, I don't talk... Because it it's not a Christian audience. And uh -huh. so I, I, I did talk about certain patterns in the Book of Revelation. I talked okay. about the beast and the, and the horror and, uh, you know... But I, it's not, it's not just, an, it's not just an interpretation of, of mm -hmm. uh, Revelation for sure. Um, yeah. Um, oh, you want to hear what I have to say about this? Well, I, I read apocalyptic literature, so there's a pattern you live every day that helps you understand that the uh, the shape of your day is the shape of your life, is mm -hmm. the shape of the entire world, even in the Bible. So, like it, for example, um, there's a riddle called the Riddle of the Sphinx. Um, it appears in Sophocles. Um, in Greek, and this is this riddle where it says, "What walks on four legs in the morning? What walks on two legs in the afternoon? What walks on three legs at night?" To save the embarrassment if you don't know the answer and making you guess. Um, the answer is a human, because a human crawls in the morning of their life, the morning part of your life. You walk on two legs, mm. you know, as you learn to walk and become an adult, and then when you're older, you have that okay. third leg, mm -hmm. the cane. You get supported <laughs> by technology to keep you moving. Mm -hmm. So um, that pattern, God was very kind. And it's like when people think like the idea of of death, dying, and in an afterlife is so strange. You rehearse it every day. Mm -hmm. You wake up, you come to your senses, you get dressed, you mm -hmm. you get prepared for work, you go and do your work, you mm -hmm. come home and you retire. You do most of the time people do more recreational things at the end. Mm -hmm. Eventually you start to lose your wherewithal, your mind starts to slip away from you. You you cannot support your body and your feet anymore. You lay down, you sleep and you have a dream. Um this is the same pattern of your whole life. If you want to look at it that way, it's the same pattern of uh, entirety of scripture. You start off in a place where you're naked, unashamed. You're fed from the tree of life. You know, you're fed like there's 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 food for you that you don't have to provide for yourself. You don't have to work. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually you realize you're naked. You get ashamed. You go out. There's something that happens like a flood, like your memories erase. The whole world becomes new around three years old for most yeah. people. Uh, you move forward. God gives us the law. The law is like our schooling. Paul mm -hmm. talks about this. I'm not making this up for my own opinion. Um, Paul talks about how we're, we're, we have the supervisor under the law that raises us up. But now in Christ, the law is written in our heart. We're adulthood. Well, that comes to an end eventually. And it, and it comes into something what you see like in, in the book of Revelation. So... Uh, where Elon Musk makes this point too, where he's talking about when you have a lot of different little nations, it's fine because if one fails, the next best one picks up, mm -hmm. the next most capable one, right? So the problem is when the whole world becomes one thing, 
what happens when our errors start to add up over time. Mm-hmm. So in a nutshell, you see this pattern in the in in scripture of like weaponized masculinity, like a cosmic version of that in the beast, and weaponized femininity in the whore. You see these two things come together where uh the world becomes almost like two contradictory things at the same time. Um, just like, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of your life is when you're more likely, or the end of your day is when you're more likely to do things that don't matter as much. Like, you know, you're more likely to participate in, in illicit sexual activity. You're more likely to waste your time on entertainment. You're more likely to drink, you're more likely to use drugs. All these things happen at night. Same thing happened to civilization. So we're going to see these things abound. Um, and then, that's those things are actually a distraction for the beast to take control. And the beast is the thing we fear of this totalizing system mm. um, that comes in and, and takes over. And that's the spirit of the Antichrist we see in the end. And jokes on the devil, because you know, this is the real short version of the story. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a kind of familiar maybe with some more details on it. But I think the story's in pattern important to understand because you actually live the story of the world every day. It's it's a very personal shaped thing that God gave us here in the cosmos mm, mm-hmm. that uh, even the heavens, what we see in the sky, being more related to our spirit and our inner workings, mm-hmm. our veiled part of us, and the earth itself, all the material being like our body, the whole universe has this human shape to it. And the cross really is the symbolism of all of these things. So when it comes to thinking of the book of Revelation, people get really worried and they start trying to guess the day, which it tells you you won't be able to guess the day. They start trying to um, read into it. They'll get confused about prophecy, which had to do with 70 AD, which is the destruction of the temple, which already came to pass. And they'll start to blend these things together and people start to take guesses. I think the um, the the important takeaway for me is that you live every day. You, you live spiritually like the world's going to end tomorrow because it's always it's always been the end of the world for everyone, all mm-hmm. the, their whole life, because you don't know when it's coming, right? Mm-hmm. So you live like that. You treat your body like it's going to live forever. Yeah. Um, but so, I, the, the, so I think Neil, what Neil's saying is, is right on. That is, the revelation is a revelation. It doesn't just talk about the end of the world. That's mm-hmm. why it's called yeah. revelation, and that's why, in some ways, it is firstly God revealing to John things about the churches, and then the second part is a, a, a revelation of the shape of the cosmos mm-hmm. and of the ultimate things. And so we have other books like that. It's not like the book of Revelation exists in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. There's right. an entire language which mm-hmm. you find in the book of Daniel mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. and in the in some of the prophetic books yeah. in the Old Testament. Ezekiel too. Yeah, yeah. that are apocalyptic mm-hmm. in the sense that they reveal the ultimate nature of how reality works. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the reality that is presented, for example, the heavenly Jerusalem mm-hmm. is the structure of a cosmos, right? It is the, it is the image of everything. Mm-hmm. And that image... Although there is a reality to the fact that the world itself will play that out mm-hmm. and will come to the end and that will reveal the fullness and all that will happen, if we just see it as like an as a kind of weird like a prediction of what's going to happen, then mm-hmm. we're missing yeah. the the point yeah. that it can bring us. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, but you also talk about too because there's there's the beauty in the story of. You, when if you guys haven't watched the the conversation, I don't know if it's been out yet uh, that you guys had earlier. You were talking about the fact that all the technology of the world came through the line of Cain, right? As trying to deal with the fact that he was left in spiritual wandering, he couldn't name things properly, he uh, couldn't produce food from the ground properly. All the technology, swords, weapons, uh, musical instruments, all these things came through the line of Cain. Even the city, the city itself. So it's like part of the fall that technology comes about because people are trying to avoid death. Well, the image at the end, the image of of the Garden of Eden um, in the very beginning is still there in the end, except that all of the stuff in the fall, like, and I'm, I'm stealing Jonathan's thunder here, all the stuff in the fall was integrated. So, like, yeah. the, the holy city, the things we see, like, all of this stuff that was, um, that had a lower state gets incorporated, and then the, the Garden of Eden is in the center of that. Yeah. So, um, I think that's wonderful. We should, if we had time to, we should... Yeah. Should make predictions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah seriously. All right. We got to start wrapping up. Right, I, okay. I still got to get you guys to in yeah. and out. Um, and you guys are on East Coast. Time, so I'm feeling I could sense that, you know, you're going to start getting tired soon. Real quick shout out to the Super Chats. I can't go over your guys' questions. Um, but uh, MRBR, thank you for the Super Chat. Rosalind Mitchell, thank you for the Super Chat. Jasmine, thank you for the Super Chat. We already talked about Mary. Uh, last question. Let's end it on this. This is, this is starting to come up. Um, 
heaven, hell, who's in, who's out, right? Um, oh. uh, salvation. Uh, there's going to be some differences, but I, here's here's the, the chat is saying Catholics and Orthodox condemn everyone who's not them to hell. That's not what I heard from Trent Horn. That's not what I heard from you guys last night. So I don't know where that's coming from. Maybe it's maybe you, you guys kept alluding to the Ortho Bros. Maybe it's like the, the no, cage, the no, cage no. stage. No, I don't no, think no, anywhere no. in Orthodox, even the even the weirdest circles, I no, don't hear that. Don't so that. I don't I don't I don't know where that's coming from, but it keeps coming up in the chat, yeah. right? Uh, what Trent Horn told me was. I think you're in. I just think you're in the wrong ecclesia. I think you're, you're, not, you're not getting the benefit of being a part of the right ecclesia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Would your guys' so the, position be so the, similar? The, the way that the way that the way that the Orthodox tend to present it, and that I've seen even several sen- saints mention it, mm-hmm. which is that we know that the true church mm-hmm. is the way that God gave us to enter into His kingdom and to participate in His kingdom. Mm-hmm. Now, as for the rest, it's not your problem. Like as for the rest, as for the man in which God manifests in in other ways, the way in which, the way in which the the, the heretics or the people that are not in communion with the church, mm-hmm. the 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 way in which they will participate in this, it's just why are you asking that question, dude? Mm-hmm. It's like just save your save yourself, mm-hmm. right? In the sense of do what Christ says. That's what you have to do. Mm-hmm. And and the, the if you know and. The partic- I do believe that the participation in the Orthodox Church is the fullness mm-hmm. of that of that truth. But mm-hmm. as for the rest, w- work out your salvation with I mean, fear. And trembling. It's like it's not. It's like I don't. Yeah, and yeah. I I can pray and I can hope and yeah. so many people will say that. Like yeah. it's like I hope that all will be saved. Yeah. Like I hope that the entire world will be saved. Yes. Like why would I hope for anything else? Yeah. You yeah. know, but that has yeah. to be real. Yeah. That can be imaginary. It's not just means that it's like, you know, you're 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 a monster and you mm-hmm. just go to heaven. Like I don't even know what that is. Mm-hmm. It's like it has to be an actual transformation yes. of people yeah. to the image of God. Yeah. That is what heaven is, anyways. And even us, like it's like if I'm Orthodox and I'm baptized and I do this and I and I believe in Jesus and I die, but I'm not I'm not how can I say this? I am not have it reveal the likeness of God in me, mm-hmm. then that has to be worked out. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, the heaven is a, the kingdom of God is a reality mm-hmm. of God ruling mm-hmm. and manifesting himself. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's not a, a hard line position within Orthodox that anyone who's not Orthodox is going to hell by default. Yeah. There's only one sin that, um, there's only one sin that you can't recover from the, the, the blas- blasphemy of the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, people worry about that. Um, you know, and that's a, the, if you think about the, the the ministry of the Holy Spirit, like uh, how the the Trinity is constantly deferring to the other persons in the Trinity, mm-hmm. um, that a, a life spent in training yourself to say what the Holy Spirit has been telling you all this time is a lie, mm-hmm. like th- to drive you away from God. There are people that will, you know, in in some of these parables is tough because there's mm-hmm. people like Lord, Lord, when did I not do these things? Like you know, and. Um, there, we don't realize, I don't think we take seriously enough at the same time how much God loves us and mm-hmm. how much he wants us to be a part of it, mm-hmm. but how much we treat God, even some people that give assent to that, like he's the enemy by constantly rejecting what we know we ought to do. So we train ourselves to run in, in away from God and hate God. So um, that's something just to guard over in your own life, because, you know, if you're, if, if this is coming out and it's not love for other people like you don't you don't love what god made in mm-hmm. in in his image and other people mm-hmm. you should really start to worry about the condition of your soul mm-hmm. um although all who's who's in and who's out in the end at the final judgment is is a mystery to all of us mm-hmm. paul talks about like all of creation's waiting to see this moment mm-hmm. um you know at that at that point so like if anybody tells you that you're doing a thing that will send you to hell mm-hmm. um it's just, it's not how it works. Yeah. It just yeah. doesn't seem to I, I, I think this is, this, this is the struggle for Protestants, if I may. I, I believe that we're saved by grace through faith alone, right? Like, I believe that's what happens. Two good, two good works. Like, saved by grace through faith, and then good, and two good works. Like, I'm going to do good works because I'm saved. God gave me a new heart, new desires. Protestants take that and make it an essential doctrine. If you don't believe saved by grace through faith, two good works, or through, saved by grace through faith alone, you're out. And that's how they're filtering this conversation, mm. right? So, yeah, so they're yeah, hearing yeah. this and they're going, wait a minute, I need to be assured of my salvation. I need to be told that like, 
I, I'm saved. And, and, and you guys are saying, like, we don't we don't quite know how it all kind of works out in the end. We believe this is to be true. Uh, salvation works a, a little bit different. I think you guys would affirm that you're saved by grace through faith. But maybe— uh, but It's like, I think it's because you it, don't understand what salvation is. Right. Like, your, your guys' view of salvation is, what is it? What did you say yesterday? I'm no, saved. It's, no, I'm but being it's not saved, just that. It's like salvation saved. means that you are saved. Mm -hmm. It means that you are— you are healed. Mm -hmm. You are transformed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are made into the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. You become the, the you you aim and you get close to the full stature of Christ. Mm -hmm. That is to be saved. Mm -hmm. We don't separate sanctification and sanctification in the yeah. Orthodox Church. Yeah. It's yeah. just all the same and, and thing. And neither do Catholics, yeah. right? Similar. Right. It's view. like this is this is a reality of the transformation yeah. of the person to yes. the image of God. Yes. So if you if all you want to know is if I'm in, I got my golden ticket. Sure. When I die, then I go yeah, to the yeah, right yeah. place. It's like, why are you doing that? Yeah. What's yeah. the point? Yeah. It's like love your neighbor, do the things that Christ yeah. asked you to do. You know, come close to God, manifest that in the world. It's like that is what you're asked to do because that is being saved. Yes. Yeah. That is what so, being saved is. So, so yeah. Again, and I don't know if that's terminology. Protestants would probably call that that being sanctified or that being refined in the fire, right? Because, but the problem with the works thing is that mm -hmm. we understand works as a bunch of stuff that you would have to do to please God, so mm -hmm. that God will let you into the pearly gates. But that's not the way to understand it. Mm -hmm. The way to understand it is that through the works we reveal the kingdom of God and we participate in the kingdom of God in in the world mm -hmm. because we become vehicles for the grace of God to to fill the world with his presence. Mm -hmm. But that is also what being saved is. Mm -hmm. That is what salvation is. It is the fullness of God in the world. Mm -hmm. So when we see the image of the heavenly Jerusalem, what we see is all the kings of the world giving up their crown and all their works and all of their civilization up to God. And that is, and so, and then God filling all the world and all the cosmos with his glory. Yeah. And so it's like, but that is what saved is. Yeah. Saved doesn't mean you die and you, you like, you, you go on the right side and then the other person goes on sure. the wrong side. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah it, it, it sounds, it sounds like you're not, correct me if I'm wrong. You're not saying the works you produce is what saves you. Well, you're does, saying the works is the, cause that, that would be my position. Our, the works our, are the evidence of salvation. There was no good work we could have done to send Christ the, the, the send Christ here to earth. Amen. And to rejoin us. Amen. Um, so is the works the evidence but or is the works well, the means? Well, the, so the, the problem is, is that just do a study in scripture, look at every time it talks about the final judgment mm -hmm. and what are people judged on? Oh, in terms of their, 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 their works. works. Yeah. yeah. Right. So th that God, we've been saved to do good works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not um, not their works of the, like, not the works of the law. Like, yeah, not, yeah, exactly. Not, not the idea that they followed this or that rule mm -hmm. or that they did this or that right mm -hmm. or that, you know, they made sure that they paid their taxes or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like the works that you do mm -hmm. are the body. Right. The, okay. It's like Christ comes and manifests himself in the body. And the body has to be transformed, which means that it's not just that it's a proof. It's like you say, I'm saved, and so therefore I do good works as a proof that I'm saved. It's like, no, the good works are salvation. Okay. That is, they are the transformation yeah. of your life into the kingdom of God. Because those things are good mm -hmm. in themselves. Sure. They're not just something you have to do to make God happy. Like, if you live according to the reality of God's incarnation, your life will be better. A hundred percent. Right, and that's a participant. That I, is salvation. Again, again I'm, I'm saying the mm -hmm. distinction is going to be how is that different than any other religion, okay, right? Okay, that, yeah. and, and, that, and that's where I think we have to be precise with language, right? Yeah, because because that's because the um, the Muslim would that's say, a "Good question." I pray five times a day towards Mecca. I mm -hmm. take my pilgrimage. I memorize the Quran. If I'm a kid, I look at my look at my works. My works are my way to heaven. Or so that, that's why I'm trying to get clarity on being very precise. I'm trying to simplify yeah. to the best and of my ability. For sure, nobody believes that that. That you could just do of enough good things to go to yes, heaven. Yes, That's a re that doesn't even yeah. mean anything yes. to me. No, yes. it's, but it's the same way. Okay, so like, let's you know, you ever make your kids apologize? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, ask, you tell them you're sorry. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. right? We know that the action happened, but the belief wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? We see it the other way around. This is called Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. It's like think only the internal state, mm -hmm. only the inner secret working of me is mm -hmm. all that's needed to produce fruit, and that th these these arguments are kind of like saying. You don't need a man and a woman to make a baby. Just one can make a baby on its own. So someone who believed only in works is like, hey, just women can just, babies can spring out of women. Mm -hmm. Or men, it's like if you're like, just believe in just, just my internal spiritual state is enough, then that guys can make babies on their own. Mm -hmm. That these things were supposed to come together. Mm -hmm. Like, so Paul says the only, when he talks about as a refutation of circumcision, 
as being a necessary practice for the Greeks. Um, he says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love, expressing itself through love. The mm -hmm. only thing that counts in the end is that faith right, has to be expressed. So when— So that's what you guys mean by the works, is yeah, it's the so faith the work, expressing good works aren't coming love. From, yes? Good works aren't coming from just, I just did a good work. Sure. Right, and, and like, you know, it's just, it's not like, it's it's both, there's a marriage yeah. of the internal workings of that are produced by faith, yeah. and that love shows up. You see the love when you do something loving. So this is why, um, but— it, James gets the most clear on it because the only time you see the phrase faith alone appear in the Bible, it says not by faith alone. So I have this. That's why I don't I understand what people are saying that like faith is this generative thing that leads to all of this, mm -hmm. all, all of your salvation. Like, I totally agree with that. But you don't want to emphasize it in a way that says faith can be alive if you don't ever do anything. Yeah. But I, I, so maybe the last thing I can say about this is that. It it comes about in the even in the very problem of the idea of going to heaven. It's a that's a serious problem in my estimation. You know, the better image to use is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. That is a better image to use because yes, the kingdom of God is when the world is aligned to the will of the king. Right? It's not arbitrary. When the when the people look to the king as their leader and they manifest his will in the world, that is the kingdom of God. So you can't, so th this separation, like this complete separation of, of like faith and manifestation is ridiculous. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, we, we can see it like when St. Paul is talking about like works and talking about saying, basically saying, if you think that just by following these rules, you're going to be transformed. That's ridiculous because everybody knows you can follow a bunch of rules without having the inner, inner transformation the way that Neil said. But it's like, if you understand the kingdom, of, of of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, as being that which saves, saves you and saves the world. But that means that it has to be transformed in practice. Yeah, yeah. I have no issue stirring people on to do good works. I have an issue when people tell me that me stirring them on to do good works is me creating a works based salvation. Yeah, like, yeah. That's and that happens in Protestant circles, which I'm not. Like if I'm like, hey, you know, the king has a kingdom. And that king has a preference on how you treat your wife. That king has a preference on how you handle your finances. Yeah, yeah. Right. The king has a way of doing things, mm. charity, poor people, like all these things. And then people go, well, that's workspace salvation. Like, no, that's not. Right. So yeah, yeah. I feel like we're it seems because like, it's like, totally it, we're intrinsically yeah. saying the same thing, yeah, but yeah, I feel yeah. like there's these little differentiations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know exactly why the difference is. Okay. So from a Protestant's perspective, Let's say you, you think of sin is like, okay, I'm driving a car. I drove poorly. I dented my car. No amount of good driving is going to fix that dent. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's right. That's a good way to think of it. Okay. So when it comes to the 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 more ancient view of salvation in the sense that um, it's not what's, what's keeping you away from God isn't that he has a rap sheet against you, mm -hmm. right? So we, we learn in 1 John that God is love. We learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love keeps no records of wrong. And so there is there is implication when people understand this improperly. They think God's asking them to do more than God himself is willing to do, mm -hmm. meaning that we're supposed to forgive freely one another and that God doesn't. God demands demands a sacrifice. Are you? I was hoping you wouldn't open this can of worms. <laughs> no, I know. It's <laughs> we right open in. the dag well, on. I'll, uh, I'll make it so short. I'll make it so short. So because I don't want. I don't want to kick. Substitution. Yeah, this is like right. I was like I don't want to go Let's into this. Go there. I'm this not is, people. They're they're looking to the wrong. They're like you're. You, I'm not telling you you're looking to the wrong Christ or anything like that. You're looking to Christ correctly. I just think it's it's a it's a better idea to not think of it that way. Like God's counted these beans against sure. you because when you think of it that way, of course works don't help. What good thing you're going to do to make up for a bad thing? Like, I mean, we try that with each other, right? Um, but but wounds have to be healed. So this is what it means to the pro propitiation of sin is that there's there's a healing uh, that needs to take place. So that, you know, Christ is working for more than just— it's it. There's too much conflict in Scripture for me to think that the problem was that God— like a judge has made a list of things we did wrong, like Santa Claus put us on the naughty list, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that that's what creates the confusion in the conversation, because when we're using these words, um, you know, Protestants sometimes are thinking about that dent analogy, 
And they're like, no, like the, there's no amount of works you can do to take that dent out mm-hmm. of the car. We totally agree. There was mm-hmm. nothing amount of goodness I could do to actually do the work that Christ did for us mm-hmm. to save us. Mm-hmm. No, no way. Um, but is that – it was at the ultimate test that so we had to pass. And then why – if that were really the case, why is creation waiting for the final judgment mm-hmm. to see this all revealed? Yeah. Can, can, can I give us a word that maybe brings us together? Yeah. Okay. We're saved by faith. Uh, by grace through faith, and the works is our reasonable response to the goodness of God. <laughs> is that fair? Well, evidence that the faith is alive. Okay, is that a, is that a, is that a reasonable response? I mean, I mean, I'll just let it. I'll just let it be. I think. I think. I mean, it's fine. Like whatever. <laughs> like I, I would say, we would probably have to keep talking about sure. this, and hopefully, maybe we can at some point. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think design. it's an interesting conversation. Yeah. Uh, the substitutionary atonement thing. I we talked about it yesterday. Joe Webbin did a whole video about uh, the the this heresy and orthodoxy as debate, and it was and it was substitutionary atonement. Last question for you guys. I don't want to make this a character uh, uh, of this was my experience. So you tell me if my experience is as accurate. Growing mm-hmm. up Oriental Orthodox, I saw a high value of tradition and a high value of the liturgy and communion and lighting the candles and be- all that stuff is beautiful to me. Mm-hmm. I saw a very low view of scripture. I saw a very low view of reading your Bible. I saw, I, I don't remember anyone when I came here, anyone reading the Bible outside of whatever Sunday school was teaching and whatever the Terhaer said, mm. N- nothing like at all. And so my experience was a bunch of folks coming to Oriental Orthodox Armenian church who were still beating their wives, who were still driving drunk. We had people that we lost that were driving drunk and died. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, a lot of these folks were refugees. They came over to America. They just escaped communism. Maybe some of that played into it. So this is my very limited. So um, high, high, high view of uh, tradition, high, high, high view of the liturgy and all the things that we did in the service. No real personal desire to read the Bible, to, to be intimate with Jesus, to pray outside of a Sunday morning context. What what I found refreshing in the Protestant circles is a high view of Scripture, a high view of personal devotion, a high view of leaning into a quiet time, into prayer, into reading. I mean, I've read through the Bible cover to cover six or seven times in my lifetime, mm-hmm. right? Like, and 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 if I took a anecdotal, exp- I don't know any folks from other streams that that hold the same view, high view of Scripture. Is is that a fair assessment or is that a caricature? Uh-huh. So, the the way that the Orthodox tradition uh, receives scripture is in community. That's the way to understand it. And okay. so we all, we all also, we're imposing a very modern situation on the church that is ancient, like you can't imagine, that mm-hmm. is ancient from the earliest times. And so, you know, the idea that people read their Bible, the ancient people, is well, they, a ridiculous idea. They couldn't That's read. the most ridiculous. Not only could they read, <laughs> where, but are you gonna get one? where are you going to get a Bible? For, yeah. Like where, yeah. So, so the way that the church received scripture uh-huh. was in the church. Yeah. Right? But but isn't the same thing that you meant you pointed to buildings earlier where like we we couldn't meet in buildings because we didn't have buildings because we were persecuted and the moment we got buildings everybody got we started using buildings. But you buildings. can't you know how how costly it was to transcribe a bible? Yeah, yeah. In, yeah, yeah. No, by, I, I'm by agreeing hand. with that. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. those there is no such thing as a full bible mm-hmm. even in the ancient world. Like nobody had the whole Bible in yeah. one book. Sure. It was yeah. like they had the Bible in different books. In pieces. Sure. But, but they didn't sure. have the whole Bible like it just just like bound together in one thing mm-hmm. because that would have been like absolutely impossible. They'd have the gospel, mm-hmm. they'd have different sections of scripture, mm-hmm. but it's like, it's it, it's just weird because we, and so the 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 church received scripture through the, through in the liturgy, mm-hmm. there's readings of scripture every day. If you participate in the liturgy every day, if you went to church every day, mm-hmm. you would hear the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, every single day, except for the book of Revelation. You, you mean every single Sunday or like no, literally every, every single day? day. Okay. It's okay. just that, it's, so it's like, it's just that most churches kind of reduced down to having one service a week, but there are services for every single day in the uh-huh. Orthodox church. And some churches will have Vespers, they'll do a few services uh-huh. or whatever. Like if you go to a monastery, uh-huh. you'll get the Bible readings in the morning, like twice a day, plus, you know, it's like nonstop mm-hmm. reading of scripture. Mm-hmm. And so... But it's meant to be in the context of community. But it doesn't. It's well, also you don't read, yeah. You don't read one of the things that I was told right away in the sense that I was always given this individual practice where I'm supposed to figure out what the Bible meant for myself. That's not a practice anybody recommends in Orthodoxy. Yeah. Not that you can't sit alone and read the Bible, but we read the Bible in the context of what it's meant to all the people who came before us. 
Um, so it's, it's not like you're trying to figure out what things meant yeah. for yourself. It's but, very helpful. But it, but I think that you have a good point, mm -hmm. and your point is definitely taken, which is that this reality about Scripture was true and reasonable in a world that is imbued with Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. in, a, in a kind of secular world, we cannot, as Christians and as Orthodox Christians, think that we can just go to church on Sunday and receive like a full teaching. This is something that would have been done organically in the ancient world that would have just been part of life, mm -hmm. you know, part of, of discussion. And so we now have to be more deliberate about that, mm -hmm. which is why some models like Sunday school mm -hmm. or, or some kind of teaching, some kind of seminar classes, mm -hmm. I think it's completely acceptable for us today. And people mm -hmm. reading their mm -hmm. scripture on their own is completely fine. And I'd never seen an Orthodox church discourage that. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's encouraged, but it is in some ways a new reality for a lot of these churches if you think of the whole history yeah you know because before it was like it was just part of life like every like every day was a feast like we're, we're all we're always celebrating some event from from the life of christ we're always always like part of it's part of our everyday life but now i think you're right that we can learn from protestants to make reading scripture part of our 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 our, our, our practice yeah so also i think anecdotally you can go to different churches like that but i would say the Trump, the, the Trump card in the traditions, meaning what is your tradition prepared for? What does your tradition do deliberately? Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to find uh, a Protestant church that I've seen yet that has more scripture involved every week publicly than the Orthodox Church. In terms does. of the Sunday morning. Not just, I mean, again, in like, terms of just a, the Sunday morning. I go to church a lot more than Sunday. I think you should come to church with me. Dude, I, I'll, I'll totally go with you. Here's, um, here's, here's, here's my here's my final thought. All right, okay, yeah, final thought, final thought, final thought. But it. a lot of scriptures read aloud, man. Like it's hard to find a tradition that reads more scripture aloud yeah. in public and builds their service. The whole service is built, built on around scripture. the gospel. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Even the my, my my thought is when I think about these things and I think about my audience and they're saying, "Oh, I'm I'm coming to an Orthodox church." My thought goes, "Hey, you believe in the Trinity? You guys believe Je same Jesus? Hey, cool. They're in." <laughs> And, uh, you know, Jesus, better than no Jesus, right? <laughs> Unlike um, the progressive arm, the progressive streams of Christianity, right? Where mm -hmm. they believe in some wonky stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, from your guys' vantage point, you guys see my audience, maybe one of uh, Orthodox person comes across, and then they end up at my church because they do FPU, mm -hmm. and then they're like, Financial Peace University class, I'm starting on mm -hmm. Monday. And then they're like, oh, man, I like Bruce Long's church. I, I, I checked out his interview with Jonathan, checked out his interview with Neil. And then they end up at my church. From your guys' perspective, is it is it kind of like the same? Like, man, a little bit of Jesus is better than no I Jesus. I definitely agree with that. Oh okay. yeah, <laughs> I, I like some I, Jesus is better than no I, Jesus. I am for grateful sure. for I am grateful for, for any atheist, any sec person who has kind of dropped out to move go into a Protestant church. I'm grateful yeah, for that's that. A good move. Nonstop. What if they What if they were Orthodox and ended up at at, at a Protestant church? Oh, I think they um I I think they can do better. Not that I mean I, <laughs> I love, love it. it. I, I love it. So I like I'm not trying to be rude. <laughs> I've done I've done everything. Yeah. Um now so I think that they're um they might choose something they're more comfortable with at the sake of something that had I mean it just it's hard to say it any other way. It's just fuller. Like so what happens when you go to different this is I'll go really fast. When you go to a Calvinist church, mm -hmm. um the songs are going to be about Calvinist things. All their songs are going to be about substitutionary atonement <laughs> and about um, yeah. and about God being sovereign. Okay, all the songs are going to be about substitutionary atonement. That's right. amazing. Okay, fine. I, That's I wrote amazing. songs with I wrote songs with like you know some of these reformed people, amazing. and I knew that if I my song, it like the song like they weren't going to like it because I didn't focus on their two main issues. Okay, the sermons. <laughs> sovereignty are be, of God, though. You said sovereignty, the, sovereignty of, God. of God. Sovereignty of God. Like sovereignty of God and substitutionary atonement. Okay. Oh my so, gosh. So okay, so. Calvinists are gonna hate me after this. No, 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 no. <laughs> Listen, I, I have so many Calvinist friends, like like um I don't hate Calvinists. I just think I, I think they can do better. Um I don't think that they're not they're not moving towards God. <laughs> okay. Um I don't I'm not I'm not trying to be exclusionary. I'm just trying to say that like, okay, from an Orthodox perspective, after being on all these different churches, if I go to a Pentecostal church, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna poop on everyone right now. No, I'm not really. Um the the songs and the worship service is going to be the singing part when I say worship service is gonna be about there's going to be a lot of Pentecostal things happening, mm -hmm. right? Okay. There's going to be somebody speaking in tongues, potentially. Someone might get up and interrupt on the microphone. The sermon, whatever they decide to read about, it's going to drive back down to Pentecostal things. Like, what makes them different? 
So like if you're a Baptist, okay, I just want to include everyone in this. If you're a Baptist, your church is literally named after a practice that you had a different view on than the people that came before you. And so everything's about what makes you different. So I I can go to all these different churches and I see things. I'm like, oh, this is like so good right here, Mm -hmm. right? And then, but the longer I would participate, the more I would get anemia for all the other things that we just didn't address. Mm. And these things are accessible to Protestants. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about these are only accessible to the Orthodox, just that part of what happens is, and we know we know the scandal of being a part of it too, it's like, you know, in a Protestant church, if you're like leaving to go to another church, it's a big problem for your pastor. He's worried about if mm-hmm. people are going to follow you or whatnot. In Orthodoxy, this isn't that kind of problem. If you go to another Orthodox church, it's like, hey, great, that's great. Um, so there's not this... There, there's not this competitive schismatic type thing, you know, so um, with schismatic things, I mean that generally you will see an emphasis on what makes that group different, you know, and that you'll feel the same thing if you came to an Orthodox church. In other words, like, hey, these guys are really into icons and paintings and chanting and, uh, you know, you're going to see that you're going to have that same impression. Um, as someone who became very familiar with Scripture, I my only concern for my friends is that they, they might end up sitting at a church trying to get their heart stirred emotionally and waiting in a sermon for a piece of information that's going to fix their life. And um, I think you know this too, because you really push practices. That's just not enough to have a Christian life. Mm-hmm. So I think that we would agree on that. So, but I do, I think the person who moved from an Orthodox church who goes to a different type of church is now going to hell or something like mm-hmm. that. Like I would never like, I'm, I yeah. can't be their friends. Sure. We can't talk about our different, like these things are, don't even ever come into my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Oh, shoot. like I mean, if I'm right, man, I think you're missing out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're okay, missing out. Cool. you're missing out. Right. But I, I no, that's good. Okay, well, agree. I hope I didn't say I too think much. We, no, no, no. I think you're fine. I think we agree that practice matters and practicing our faith is important. Yeah, right? I know. I, that's yeah. that's part of the thing. I like watching your talks and like yeah. your prayer journal and stuff. Like, hey, I'm pushing your prayer journal for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that thing, I think journal, that's a guys. great idea. All right, guys, we're gonna get out of here. I got, I'm gonna take these guys to In and Out. They've never had In and Well, you had In and Out. Yeah. yeah, I lived in California. Jonathan has never had In and Out. It's his first time in Southern California, so we're gonna get some In and Out. Um, thank you guys for hanging out. Make sure you are following Neil from Dirt, Dirt Poor, Poor Robins. Robins. It's uh, amazing, amazing music. And of course, Jonathan Pejo. All platforms, I can find you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it gets about the world.com. Pronunciation's getting worse as it yeah, goes yeah, along. Yeah, yeah, it get worse. Gosh, and, uh, and if you're interested, like, I'm <laughs> going to I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, like, a Apple shameless a shameless plug here. Please it's do. Because next, tomorrow, we are launching a graphic novel called God's Dog, and it is a plunge into the Christian worldview. There's Leviathans, giants, angels, saints, all this kind of all this kind of stuff mixed into this this one kind of epic story that we're telling over several books. Yeah. So we want to also, and we have like secular uh, comic book artists that are willing to come on in and do some stuff with us, and we're getting some interest. And so we want to kind of knock it out of the park to also show the world that 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 it is possible to do Christian art in a way that is powerful and meaningful and not just propaganda. Yeah, you guys got something about the conference. Super cool. Oh. Thank you. You're even better than me because I was going to forget it. Um, yeah, that co- uh, the comic book, the story. I've read the whole story ahead of everybody else, so I make them jealous because it, it ends so beautifully too. Um, I think it's a, a masterwork you've done with that story. Um, the conference, There's if you follow Jonathan, you can find it in the symbolic world. There's a conference. If you got excited at all, we didn't get to talk about a ton, but symbolism, typology, it's really about those things in Scripture and how they're coming back into the world, how... Uh, you know, as an artist, how storytelling can be more vertical. We can deal with the fact that, you know, we're not just part of some arbitrary universe, that there's actually meaning being infused in the universe, um, and that that pattern can be understood and enrich you as a person and uh, change the way you see the world and change your joy and your peace and all kinds of things it can do. So um, that was the worst description of the conference possible, but... If you're in Florida, yeah, yeah Tarpon Springs, uh, late at the end of February... Only, it starts on leap year, yeah, so, so look it's that called up. Symbolic World Summit, look it up. We'd love to meet you and greet you there. I'm dropping a record the same day. Oh! Ooh. Firebird. That's right. All and right, then they're going to perform, so... Yeah. We're going to get out of here. All right. Love you guys. Peace. We see, according to the Bible, that prayer is extremely important in terms of us being transformed from the inside out when we get aligned with God's will. For the Christians watching this channel, I want you guys to implement these spiritual disciplines in your day-to-day life. And the only way I've been able to do this consistently is through writing down my prayers in a prayer journal that does a few things. One, it allows me to reflect and come to God humbly and ask him to move on my behalf. And two, it allows me to document my prayers, which ultimately helped me remember the very things that I was praying for and see the hand of God tangibly in my life when he answers them. So I would urge you, 
consider writing down your prayers. It could be in a blank notebook. It could even be on your phone. Or you could check out the one I personally designed and used for my own quiet time and spiritual discipline that I think will be a huge blessing. It's the exact structure and system that I've used for years to pray and be more consistent in my spiritual disciplines. You can pick yours up today by clicking the link in the pinned comment below. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace.